So yeah, so let me just get into that. Why don't we do that? Let's do it. So um, yeah, let's kind of frame this for our audience because I don't, uh, you know, I, I've not really done this before, uh, this kind of recorded discussion. I usually, I've got my YouTube channel, Talking Head, <laughs> where it's yeah. just usually me, half yeah. scripted, half kind of improvised. I've got yeah. my, my cameraman there. He's kind of funny and he kind of interjects yeah. sometimes. But this kind of recorded discussion, I've not done before. So, so uh, it's new for me and I kind of want to, uh, if you allow me, Brent, to kind of set this up for my for any audience who might be tuning in through my channels, because again, this will probably be new for them. So, so uh, let me just set this up. Um, I had reached out to you, uh, I think, last weekend uh, to do uh, this recorded session. We talked about doing a recorded session um, a while ago, uh, but I reached out to you. This time felt right because I had just gotten back from a holiday. Uh, on the west coast of Denmark, I uh, started to get back into my book project that I'm working on. I had written these art direction briefs. I was very happy with those. Um, and I was getting ready to get back into kind of the final chapters and, and kind of come up with the, the prescriptional part of my, my book and, and jump down those rabbit holes, basically. You know, do, do the research, kind of go, go into, into a little personal hole. But at the same time, you know, just to set this up, uh, in context of what's going on in the world, it felt like the wrong activity to just d dive right back into research because you know there was all this social unrest. The world was very upset and it felt better you know, to actually be talking politics rather than doing, you know, there's time for research and there's time for, you know, I'm a human being. I need to, I need to flesh this stuff out with people. You know, I need to talk yeah. about this stuff also to yeah. even to figure out how, how I'm feeling about this stuff. That, that was what felt right. And, and since, again, since we talked about doing a session before, uh, I reached out to you. So that's why we're here. Yeah. yeah let, me, let me commend you for that too, because yeah. I, think, I think that's what a lot of people should be doing. Um, yeah. And a lot of people aren't. They're kind of retreating. And I would, all, I would also just say, you know, as you might suspect, I kind of consider myself, you know, to, to like always have a foot in both worlds, right? So these, yeah, 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 yeah. the unrest is emerging now, but I've been trying to talk about these things for, for years, right? Of course. And but it's that's only why when, the, yeah, yeah, it's only when like something happens like a school shooting or, or a pandemic or whatever yeah. That all like everyone you know talks about it, and then there's lots of, there's lots of good discussion, and there's lots yeah. of noise, and there's lots yeah. of people saying like, oh, don't politicize this as an opportunity or whatever. Uh, um, yeah, and, I know and, what you and, mean. And yeah. that's part of the noise, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. because because um you know there's a message that wants to be heard all the time. Yeah. So yeah. and and so those two things, and I like the fact that you know you identify as conservative and I identify as leftist. And that we're able to attempt to bridge that gap, not only, you know, on a semi-regular basis through theory, but now in this case, through like real, real stuff, concrete, you know. Human That's human actually very interesting, Brent. I hadn't stuff. thought, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. We sure theory is, it's mm -hmm. a bit easy because it's, it's a bit objective and maybe it's historical or whatever. So it yeah. might be, let's see what happens with this, Brett, actually, because <laughs> this is a, you know, this is uh, the first time, as you say, the first time we meet over a hot topic. Mm -hmm. So coming from two sides kind of as a starting point, let's see where this leads. That's interesting that you say that, but now you've kind of, I, I did want to kind of give a, again, setting this up for, for people who are tuning in through my channels. I want to give a bit of background to you how I know you and, and who, who I see you as so that people know who I'm talking with. Um, and you've, you've done a bit of that now by saying that you try and play in both ponds. You do your research and you're also very a public figure. But, you know, I, I, I want to give you praise. You know, I have been quite critical to you on my, on my YouTube channel. I've said, you know, you're sometimes too much epistemic. You know, you're up yeah. in this intellectual world and I want, to come, I want to come down to the human level. I've critiqued you for that on my channel. Uh, but that just goes to show that we can also continue yeah. to cooperate, yeah. uh, despite some differences. But I want to now. I want you know. I, in my channel, I actually didn't get a chance to at that time also commend you for this exact same thing, you know, because you. Now I've called you kind of this. I've framed you as kind of giving you this moniker of of the the 
not the, but the metamodern <laughs> historian. Yeah. I mean, I really admire the work that you do as far as, you know, and you're also, to kind of characterize you again, I hope I, hope I get you right, but, you know, you're a guy who really likes to honor terms and be pure with your terms okay yeah. yeah you're shaking your head good so you've really latched onto this metamodern word and you're you're one of the projects that i see you involved in is being very pure about this word and trying to figure out what this word is and doing your historical research again being this historian to find out how it's been used uh and how it can be a helpful term for us going forward so it's just some praise on that because i do respect that you've You've published the um, Borgman article mm -hmm. and the Gonzalez article. Did, did Those, you see uh, the one in the side view, which was published like a month ago now? Yeah, like, that one didn't resonate with me as okay, much, but I, okay. it, it might just be because I'm familiar with the other work and it okay. felt a bit Yeah, I just it bring it up because it was, but, it was very high level. I did introduce some new sources that I hadn't discussed. And I also, uh, okay. you know, I, 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 I liked how you know Adam helped edit it and, and mm. ended up being structured in a certain way, but but I, I had to cut out a lot of stuff. Like I cut out mm -hmm. all the hyper modern stuff. Right. And that's, that's okay. a, that's a separate growing, growing article. Yeah. Um, it's really I, a shame that he cut that out. Sorry to butt in, but yeah, you know, my was, reflection yeah. on that whole journal was that it was way too meta modern. It would have right. been nice if right. your article was actually hyper modern to give it some balance. Sure. Sure. That's be too critical to Adam if he watches this, but yeah, we, we left <laughs> my impression. Yeah. I left a bit mm -hmm. at the end about hyper modernism from mm. from a particular source from like 1992 i think mm. uh 89 92 so it was like very relevant to the meta modern source of that time <clears throat> but also you know uh davoud gosley who's also in the volume you know he did a great video mm. about the three meta modern articles and he did a nice kind of you know reflection and juxtaposition uh so there's that there's kind of there's generative yeah, content here and then there's also, I wanted to say, like, you know, with respect to your videos, you know, like I watch them and I, you know, you're free to, to say whatever you want. So I kind of like, you know, appreciate the interpretations that, that it's like, it's coming from an authentic place for you. Right. So like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's, it's, okay, it's fine if you mischaracterize me um, <laughs> because it's like, it's got its own kind of resonance to it but we, we can work those things out. Right. So like, I, I actually like kind of how you describe me as a, as a, as a meta modern historian, but um, cause, cause I'm sort of doing that function, but it's also like, you know, meta modern historiographer, meta modern mm -hmm. historicist. Yeah, historicist. <laughs> right? So I'm not okay. just, tr I'm not just <laughs> tracking it. And also just to clarify for listeners and for you, I'm not trying to own the word. I'm trying to map it so we can all use it more yeah, i understand more constructively way. so so yeah. you know my my side view essay that was kind of that was kind of the gist like you know we need to study postmodernism more carefully mm -hmm. and and we need to kind of actually like honor the like the 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 difference and the overlap of different words mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and um practice I respect you for that also because yeah. i think often the metamodern narrative has been one of just uh disregarding the postmodern yeah. and you know i'm a guy i i like adorno i don't know if he falls into that camp but he's a guy i i can draw a lot out of from his language so there's just an yeah. example just to support you <clears throat> yeah and and it's a practice to do this collective intelligence thing it's not something we should take lightly and i think a lot of people mm. in the space you know, dilute the term and, you know, mm -hmm. can conflate it with integral or conflate it with, you know, a uh, game B or what, whatever. Yeah. Right. So let's, mm. let's, uh, let's be scientific. Let's, let's tease out yeah. the differences. If that is part of your project, I really like that. I always, we're not getting very quickly into the meat of our discussion, but a good we'll tangent there. points, good tangent points is I, because I don't, you know, I just, I don't know, maybe you can use this as some of your material, but I don't identify at all as, a, as an integralist, but I do as a metamodernist. Mm -hmm. So when that discussion comes up, yeah. I'm just kind of left on the sideline. I don't even know how to remark it. Like, I, I can't enter the discussion because I'm not in their world. You know, does that make sense to you? Yeah, and, and, and me too. But I have, done the, <laughs> I have done the homework and I have a critique of integral uh, as a community, especially um mm. for being kind of way too apolitical or way too centrist right mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. so i'm not just like 
like uh, ignorant about it, but I'm trying to like wade into that territory and yeah, set some con set some conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. Let's see. Do do we set it up pretty well? I, I just so. wanted to say, you know, your, your work actually is. Uh, you know, it's paid off. I wanted to say that also to this. I mean, you have thousands of followers. No, no, right, I, don't, right? I don't. I don't. You don't? I, don't. I thought. I, mean, I, have, I, a th I have a thousand a followers on, on, on Facebook and maybe a thousand on Medium, yeah. but it's really, it's there really pretty insignificant. Like, on, don't people, be humble. That's thousands. Um, people don't see, <laughs> people don't see stuff. Like, like, let me, let me, let me just contextualize <clears throat> it. Cause, cause yeah. I have a couple, I have a couple people that I follow on Twitter, for example, that have mm. like 30,000 followers. Right. Oh yeah, sure. I, I understand you're not the right, top but, dog, but you're a dog. Right, but in the meta modern. Uh... Right, but but these people who they they follow me and they'll yeah. re they'll retweet something that that I tweeted and they'll be like, oh, this yeah. is amazing. Like, hey, check this out. And okay. then it gets like no likes or no retweets. And so this is hmm. the this is the the kind of frivolousness of, hmm. of social media, you know the the kind of. Yeah, it's just you. It's a crapshoot. You have no control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter how many how many followers you have. Sometimes people don't see your content. There's yeah, all sorts okay. of reasons to like be like to tune out from content, right? Because none of my content is particularly addictive, or like s s sends you down like like r rabbit holes. It's just like yeah, it's not like this conspiracy theory that you can then get wrapped up into. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that I understand a, a bit. I don't know if it's entirely true, but I, I, I let's not dig into that too much. I, I, I understand yeah. what you're trying to argue there. Yeah, we're, 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 we're all small fish. Like I, I appreciate what you're doing, you know, putting yourself out there with your just talking head videos, because <laughs> that's, that's something I'm trying <laughs> to work head. up to. Um, yeah. it's, 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 it's also a special skill. So <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're, well, we're thanks part, for we're, that. We're part it's of the, you know, I, I really honor just the authentic authenticity. You know, this book I'm writing is called the how to nurture truth and authenticity. Cause that's, that's a big virtue for me. Uh, so any of those kind of, you know, use the word conflate, conflated discussions that, that kind of obstructs that I, I dislike. So maybe contrarily, if I only have 50 followers, it's also okay, you know, if, as long as those guys really appreciate the, the, yeah, the authenticity that I'm trying to go for. But anyway, let's, uh, you know, I had a topic in mind for this discussion that I think will shoot us off in a couple healthy directions. And, and it might even draw out some of our differences, and that might be interesting for our audience, I would imagine. And I think recently I had come across, uh, or perhaps you linked me to this, this interview you had done, with this Russian uh, language department in yeah. Moscow. It yeah, wasn't it was Russian language English. or Russian it, uh, literary? It, it was an English department, oh, English. but okay. it's actually called Russian Language University or something like that. Like it's just yeah. a, a weird name for a university, but it's the English department within this Russian language university. Okay. So. okay. Yeah, they were they were very good at English, so that, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I also appreciated this article because I'm I, I find a lot of good stuff coming out of Russia lately. My wife is Russian, so there's oh, kind yeah. of this gravitation I'm feeling right now to Russia. You you were cool. actually part of that gravitation. But anyway, coming back to that that content of that that interview you did, uh, I specifically was drawn to really to, to to one comment you made, and I was like, you know, I was kind of doing this in my head to you when nice. you had said this because. It was, it was, I think, regarding uh, some of the social unrest, the, the, the riots and the protests and the looting and so forth uh, happening over the past few weeks. But the thing that I liked that you had said uh, was that you felt that they were symptoms uh, of, of something much more foundational than, than, than both race and po police brutality. And, and I was very happy to hear you say this because I agree. And, and, and I think, you know, when I look at the, the range of problems that the metamodern narrative is trying to deal with, uh, you know, racism and police brutality, they, they may offer something, but they don't offer a space for the full picture. And so I, I think it's nice that you said that. And I would actually go even further and say something a bit controversial, I hope, it may be interesting, because I would actually say that those discussions draw out uh, some diversion and they obstruct actually the, the discussion that I want to be having that's more foundational. And I know that that, that would be a, quite questionable to people that, you know, they want attention on these two issues. 
because they're because they're yeah. very topical at the moment and we've got videos that you know disturb us so i get that but i i i want to address it from a much more you know meta modern perspective a bit more robust perspective so i appreciate what you had said there so kind of maybe maybe you can jump off there yeah maybe react to my position but also maybe ground ground your own position there too for sure yeah. that's uh that's a great setup <clears throat> um there's definitely a tension right between kind of the specific inciting incidents about this right and the specific demands and then the big picture right and so so different people within and without the movement uh are going to be kind of torn between that um and for me it's about both right it's not to to downplay the seriousness of systemic racism um, that's something I've, you know, tried to bring up a lot and at least point out as a, a kind of, you know, blind spot of metamodernism, right? Uh, particularly in, in the Black Metamodernism article. And, uh, you know, this big cultural divide, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of catalyzed by the intellectual dark web was around, you know, between social justice and kind of individual, you know, autonomy or whatever. And, and it's a false, it's a totally false dichotomy, right? But, but part of the kind of the, the mission and the, the, the mantra of the intellectual dark web is like anti-left, anti-social justice, like, n like not historicizing, you know, and, and overly mytho mythologizing. So I think they're wrong. I think they're on the wrong side of mm. history, as it were. Mm. Yeah, and I know now, you're- Now yeah. these events, yeah. you know, force everything <laughs> back together. But when mm -hmm. I say it's about the big picture, that's just not my, my, my read of it. That is, you know, coming from some people within the movement. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also like, you know, like, like look at other protests, right? That are different. Like go back nine years to Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. This is the same, the same thing, right? So people are, you know, capitalizing on this moment to, you know, for, for racial justice and to, end the police state effectively like end militarized militarized policing around the world right because we've seen pro like like before this started you know it's not widely televised but but over the past year and years we've seen protests erupt all over the world chile hong kong right where people decent people just you know fighting for freedom are having to show up on the streets to fight essentially military <laughs> you know there's there's an absurdity to it and it's it's very you know not to put this on your conservative shoulders but it's a very right-wing kind of neo-fascist phenomenon right like jair it's bolsonaro gonna, yeah. in in brazil and yes. you know so on and so <laughs> forth <laughs> mm -hmm. so um you know so the goal is, is twofold right it's to it's to achieve you know ending systemic racism you know changing the discourse you know and and for for you know the abstraction of of white people and whiteness to um you know do their part and you know mm. because these historical moments keep coming back you know mm. and when mm. we we yes. kind of quote unquote white people have a responsibility to come to terms with the historical truth it doesn't mean that we are personally directly responsible for all of it but uh but we are entangled in it you know mm -hmm. and if, mm -hmm. if if anybody takes the time to study the sociological discourse around these things mm -hmm. um it becomes more and more clear rather than when mm -hmm. rather than the way it's it's muddied by conservatives mm -hmm. and and just last night like i watched i watched a, a four hour um twitch stream Right by this, uh, by this young black uh, female kind of activist and and streamer and and you know she spent uh, most of the time reading through an article on police brutality and whiteness, you know, and so she she's going through the deep theory and and unpacking it and talking about it and you know this is this is the type of stuff that conservatives way way on the other side are making fun of. And they don't even mm, mm, they don't mm. even know that what yeah. this what this this discourse exists. Mm. They don't even know what it actually mm. is, right? Because yes. it is very yeah. it is very nuanced. It's very postmodern, right? Yeah. So it's just it's threatening. It's confusing. Yeah. 
Yes. And you know, it's a, once we realize that, it's a huge gap to bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That can I jump? Right. Can I jump off you? Yeah, one, oh, one, shoot! One, you have so much more to say. Yeah, one more go point. Ahead. One more. One yeah, more point. Definitely, just, of course. Just to, just to conclude, all yeah. that said, you know, we're seeing a bunch of anti-racism books surge to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Mm. Okay, I haven't seen that. Yeah. So you know, so the 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 zeitgeist is mm. moving. You know, for me, it can't happen soon enough. <laughs> we need to keep pushing. I know that's, but, but that's part of you, yeah. The zeitgeist is, is slowly opening up and, you know, mm-hmm. you know, different people are talking about it differently. <clears throat> we see a lot of resistance from people like Joe Biden, ironically, because yeah, yeah, yeah. he could really seize this moment and just, just yeah. you know, crush the election. But, but shit yeah. is fucked up and, and um, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Okay. Uh, there were a couple times when I got a bit uncomfortable with what you were saying, and I'm glad that you acknowledged it. You know, you didn't mean to throw all the, the weight on my conservative yeah. shoulders, so I appreciate that also. Uh, but there were a lot of things you said that I did like. Uh, so I, I, I think I want to jump off of those things. And one can thing I, I wrote I, down I, was... Sorry, can I throw one, okay. one more word out? I, I yeah, kind of, sure. I, I kind of skipped over this. I, wanted, I, I okay. mentioned it in my metamodern talk with the Russians is yes okay. alter alter globalization right alter globalization yes, talk about that yeah. is already defined as part of metamodernism by vermeulen and van den Acker, and this mm-hmm. is the kind of discourse that frames the the the, the struggle of protests right from the w, mm-hmm. w, wto protests in mm-hmm. seattle to mm-hmm. occupy to do mm-hmm. these black lives matter protests so i just wanted yes. to bring that word yeah in. yeah Sorry. It's good, actually, because that's exactly where I wanted to take it towards a metamodernism now. That's kind of where I was feeling. But to jump off of what you said before, what I was going to say was, you talked about changing the discourse. You, you threw that out there. And I wanted to jump off that and then take this towards um, how I kind of stand uh, with metamodernism and what I see as kind of the healthy, uh, you know, I, it's true. I traditionally come from, you know, I grew up li- watching uh, Bill O'Reilly and thinking, yeah, this is the guy for me. Th- this narrative feels right. So growing up, I grew, you know, I'm, I'm coming from that background. But it's not to say, you know, having discovered metamodernism, having now read philosophy for 15 years, I have obviously much more articulate words to use. I would never <laughs> go to Bill O'Reilly today. But anyways, yeah, coming yeah. back to the metamodernism, just to give some, some background, because I really see you know, there's, there's still a lot of defining going on about what metamodernism is. But for me, it really resonates when I talk about it as a, as a very romantic aesthetic. And what I mean by that, and in fact, I even went out with, for drinks with some guys last night and we talked about this. So I'm going to call that, that, you know, we were talking about how having the metamodern narrative means that you can, obviously, you can go beyond left and right discourse but also, you know, merge them, but go beyond them. Because, you know, it, it kind of embodying this, this discourse for me uh, means, if what it means for me is I'm not really pulled into action by either of those discourses. They don't, they don't, they don't pull me in, you know, I'm, you know, again, coming back to that romantic, it, it's not, it doesn't give me any kind of lust for life. You know, I don't kind of want to go after those, uh, those narratives and act on them because I'm kind of beyond it. I have a narrative that that's, that feels like it can play, to talk nastily about it, it can play both sides. <laughs> but, you know, to speak better about it, 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 can, it, it can, it's a discourse that can talk to both sides in a productive manner. That's probably the, the better way to say it, now that I'm kind of rambling here. But, uh, you know, I think what, you know, I'm a guy. I, here, yeah, here's, I think, what I want to say about you know, I said earlier, I feel like it's kind of diverting the discourse, these, this racism and police brutality. I want to I want to reflect on that. So I think I'm, I'm a guy that is, and I admit this, I'm a guy that is hard for me to feel disgust. That may sound like I'm a bit inhuman, but it's not my natural reaction because, you know, I, you know, I, I feel like often the left and the right go towards this emotion. They go towards feeling disgusted. They, they want to show a meme. They want to get snarky. Snarky is kind of another aspect to this. Let's just get snarky and cut off the conversation. I see disgust kind of doing the same thing. When I, you know, when someone's disgust comes forward into the social environment, 
it's now an object that I kind of have to contend with. I have to now deal with, with kind of that, you know, that's, that's that kind of interpersonal needs that come along with that. And I'm kind of distracted from, from thinking about this in a more rational way. So that kind of disgust doesn't resonate with me. And, and I often feel that is what's happening with left and right discourse. We're going into these, these modes that shut down the conversation. You, you mentioned, I think you mentioned snark earlier also. Uh, so, you know, kind of being, coming back to that kind of that label of being a romantic metamodern. I'm not so interested in getting caught up in, in this disgust. It often feels very postmodern to me to kind of contrast it to that aesthetic. But, you know, also going further, you know, for me, this metamodernism is about, well, there's the book, you know, the listening society It's definitely about listening and any, yeah. anything that comes in my way of having that productive discussion, it, 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 it doesn't, yeah, you know, it doesn't feel metamodern. It, it, it feels like I've been stuck in the old paradigm and I have to react to those old, those old issues. Huh? And I want to get to a place where I can talk. And I, you know, I play both sides of the field, honestly, you know, you're coming from the left. I talk to people on the right, you know, I want to come to a place where I, I am actually in my organism resolute enough that I can have a healthy discussion with both sides. Cause I, you know, I would couple that listening society. I do, I would definitely espouse that. I agree to that, but also I think there needs to be some kind of intimacy, some kind of security so that I can disclose who I am and how I'm feeling uh, some security, some safety, you know, I'm not going to get attacked if I, Hey, I, I have this feeling, I have this emotion and, and now let's talk about it. And, and yeah, where do we go from there? But I, I, you know, I, I, I need some intimacy around that situation. So these are the types of environments that I'm interested in breeding as a meta modern. And, you know, as I was kind of thinking about this, I've got one more point and I'll kind of let you respond. As I was thinking about this, I was like, well, Justin, how can you call that romantic? It sounds so objective and cold. And you just said, you don't, you're not disgusted over police brutality videos. You know, well, <laughs> this doesn't sound like romantic at all, but I don't think that that's, you know, again, that's not how it doesn't feel that way to me. I'm interested in having those discussions with somebody so that, you know, I can get excited by their words so that I can, I, again, kind of being pulled by, by the phenomena of my experience into something positive. This is kind of how I would call the romantic experience, having that lust for life towards something positive and then, yeah, not dwelling in maybe that, that postmodern disgust or whatever. So I, <laughs> yeah. I do see it as very romantic condition to, to try and embody, you know, <clears throat> how does that sound to you? Yeah. Um, so, you know, as you know, I try to produce kind of different output, right? So mm -hmm. di different, different forms. So there on some level and some of my output, I'm very disgusted by what, mm. by, by what I see on the right. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I would say just really, you know, turned off and also to some extent disgusted by what I see in the center. Mm -hmm. you know, I know by, you are. Yeah. by 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 what by what are what are liberals right like like mm. hillary clinton right nancy mm. pelosi mm -hmm. um you know the people that were against bernie sanders right mm -hmm. so so we need to like always foreground that there's not really both sides there's not really two sides there's there's mm. a huge yeah. political map yes right and people are all i agree to place, that yeah. and, they, and people can move on that yes, map, of course, yeah. um, on different issues, and <clears throat> and so the way I've been framing it, kind of for years, and also just crystallizing it more lately, is that there's at least three three main sides. There's <laughs> there's the right, <laughs> there's the liberal <laughs> kind of alt center, you know, whatever, and like third third way politics, you know, <laughs> and I think that's defunct. I think that's compromising to the to the neoliberal trend, which is bankrupting people. And then there's the left. There's a, like a strong, broad-based, grassroots coalition uh, that is kind of eco-socialist, right? And it doesn't mm -hmm. get enough credit. It's painted mm -hmm. as this sort of minority, radical left. That is mm -hmm. not the true kind of description of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So there's all that, right? Mm -hmm. And then also what occurs to me, and you know, I've, I've, I've brought this up, many other times before but like a conservative that i admire and mm -hmm. i and i wish other conservatives would emulate more is edward snowden mm -hmm. 
Right. And he does like kind of, kind of perform multiple roles. You know, he's, he's kind of pigeonholed himself a little bit as the, as the security guy, but, Mm -hmm. but you know, he's, he's kind of a good public thinker. He identifies as conservative, but not Republican, Mm -hmm. you know, like he may have grown up like you, like on Bill O'Reilly or whatever. And I know he grew up with a traditional, like, like kind of uh, like military slash intelligence family. Right. So that was like bred into him, but yeah. he kind of defected, right? He had, he mm. had a metanoia. He had um, his whistleblowing moment, which was mm. like super heroic. Like, it, you know, he doesn't like to be called a hero, but, mm. but fuck that. I, I, I think what he did is super heroic. I think what Glenn Greenwald did to help him and other people is super heroic. And we need more of that. And, and so not only did all that happen, look at the response to all of that, right? The, the, the Trumpist right wants him dead. The, the liberal center wants him in prison. And the eco-socialist left wants him free to, you know, to, to have these embodied high-level conversations with us, you know, for, 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 for truth and justice. Like, you know, so for me, like, you know, it's pretty obvious, like, you know, who's on the right side of history and who should be free yeah. yes, and, and who shouldn't, you know, yeah. who, who should be charged. It's, in, it's interesting that in you, prison. I yeah. appreciate that you've, uh, you know, I, I, thanks for correcting me about talking about both, playing both sides. I think people probably know what I mean when I say that, but yeah. Yeah. it's because there's an exacerbation that happens, right? Yeah. And now you, you have to respond to that. Yeah. So that's what I was framing that as when I say play both sides. But Can clearly, I make a, a couple more. more quick points? Oh, did you? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I wanted just to, cause, yeah, go cause, ahead. Just because I'm, I'm now taking notes just so I make sure I don't miss anything. So I'll be, I'll be really quick. Just, you yeah, know, go ahead. I, I agree with you on the romantic ideal. And so ah, what I have to yes. say is, you know, mm-hmm. you know, while I feel the disgust and I express that mm-hmm. disgust often, I also like, you know, made a kind of satirical art film that is like totally stoic ideal. Like there's no disgust in it. There's a lot no. of mockery, right? And so that's a that's yeah. a different a different kind of facet of my project, right? Yeah, and then yeah, there's the kind true. of the, the research and the writing itself, which, you know, I try not to be too, you know, disgusted. Um, uh, anyway, so I'll stop there and then say, you know, about the kind of, you know, like the, the space you're aspiring mm-hmm. to to have this kind of free thought and, and open conversations. To me, it's like, like we, we, can, we can construct that on the internet, but it's also reminiscent of classrooms, right? And, you know, mm-hmm. as, as they are kind of also defined as like safe spaces for people to learn mm-hmm. and for mm-hmm. ideological people to come into and not be judged, mm-hmm. right? So the, 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 going back to the IDW, you know, the irony of demonizing teachers and the spaces themselves for trying to create environments in which people can learn is, is, you know, on some level kind of disgusting (laughs) and and anti-intellectual. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say. There's a couple things I can respond to here, but I, I, maybe it's uh, good to again, respond to kind of that interpersonal human need here. I'm not saying that, you know, having discussed, is wrong. I mean, I'm a big proponent of this idea of truth (laughs) and, and this idea of truth as, as very uh, conditioned pre pre precognitively. And what I mean by that is, I mean, I always call back to the relationship advice. I mean, you're never supposed to make someone feel bad for the, for the feelings that they have. And even worse, you know, you shouldn't critique them for having those feelings. And, you know, I kind of see truth in this way. We come upon the truth and well, that's what now we have to contend with, but coming back to your disgust, you know, it, it, I'm not trying to say that, oh, don't, you know, don't have it. That, that would be wrong to do. I'm just, I think we agree. Once it appears in a social context, it's, you know, it's hard. So I'm kind of really not for this flattering of our utter disgust. You know, I see a lot of people using that as a mechanism. I'm yeah. utterly disgusted. Yeah. Okay, kind of, but... <laughs> yeah, kind of a gratuitous indignance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if you're genuinely dealing with it, you know, come together. I will help you with that. You know, yeah. let's talk. You know, I will help you talk, talk about talk it out. Even if I don't genuinely feel it, I, I think that we can do that as humans. So anyway, just to say that... <laughs> 
find that, that you feel disgust over some, some certain things. Um, the other thing that you just said, which I thought was interesting. Um, oh, one more thing before I say the interesting part. You talked to, you were trying to divide up the political uh, landscape by saying that there's three spheres, you know, and, and you talked about this eco, uh, eco uh, solutionist left. Eco socialist. Yeah. Yeah, eco socialist left. Um, you know, I, I have tried to start to formulate something about a right leaning eco uh, socialist move. And, and when I, when I, when I say that I have in mind people like EF Schumacher, I don't know if you've read small is beautiful, but his book in the seventies, apparently I didn't know this reading it, you know, it was a big uh, inspiration became, you know, classic literature for a lot of the green movement activism at that time. And, you know, I, I'm a guy who's actually not, when I hear Greta talk, for example, it doesn't resonate with me because it's, it right. contends, it contends with that object, the global. And I'm not, you know, again, my metamodernism, the reason why that narrative resonates with me is because I'm about animating human affectivity. You know, I want a direct feedback loop with phenomena. I'm also quite a phenomenologist. So I'm really into this, this feedback loop and ecstatic. Um, yeah. I won't say much more words about that, but you know, then when I read someone like Schumacher, I get really activated because it, it feels like his book is called Small is Beautiful. And I'm, you know, I'm, I, this resonates with me, you know, I'm about local governance and things like that because there I can put myself in action. So, you know, because yeah. it's local, because yeah. it, because it, because of that, it feels more right. And I, this is where, I, so I don't know if you want to open up your, your political landscape and add maybe yeah. this to it, but this is something I haven't articulated it completely. I'm doing more yeah. now than I ever have before, but yeah. it's something I'm feeling anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I got mm -hmm. a, a few points that come up. One is like yeah. you know, the, the kind of social theory and discourse on globalization, you know, is not at the expense of one or the other. Like there's this term like glocalization, you know, the glocal, yeah, like yeah, global and local. Such a terrible yeah. word though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a mouthful. Um, but, you know, I do probably seem focused on the global a lot. Like I, I, yeah. I, le I lean into that. But for me, it's not at the expense of the local. It's just a matter of finding the right, the right, the right role because each locale is different, right? And, and I've okay. traveled a fair bit, right? So I've been to mm -hmm. like India and South America and those are wildly different places that, mm -hmm. you know, have the, have the kind of like, like the boot stamp still of Western imperialism, right? Yeah, so yeah. we need to like really, really empathize with the, the, mm. the, the context there, right? The, but that the, sounds totally like the, 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 the animation of the local I'm talking about. I, yeah, this yeah, totally resonates yeah. with me. Yeah. And, and yeah, I don't, I, you know, I try not to eschew it. Like I, I try to get involved locally somewhat, but I have mm -hmm. certain limitations that are unique to me. Right. And, and yeah, also, well, yeah, but don't apologize for that. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, you know, I try to, I try to balance that. And I, you know, I get into yeah. debates with, with people like, for example, Jason Snyder, who is also mm -hmm. like very focused on the local, like his own, like where mm -hmm. he is in the Appalachians, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. bio regional, you know, resilience and, and regen yeah, regeneration, yeah. right? So he's really yes. keen on that stuff. And he's so keen on it. It's at the expense of a kind of mm. like literacy and awareness of, of what's going on mm -hmm. out there and how mm -hmm. we're connected to it. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, had to, mm -hmm. I had to kind of nudge him quite a bit from where he was, you know, a year ago, like mm -hmm. wanting to vote for Elizabeth Warren in the primary you know, and then Michael Brooks persuaded him to vote for Bernie Sanders. And then even still, I had to keep nudging him because like, like, you know, localism aside, he was just disinterested in politics. And there's lots of people mm -hmm. in, in these spaces who are disinterested in politics because yes, politics yes, yes. is messy and it's a conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And, you know, so there's people that <clears throat> just, just eschew that. They don't want to get into it. Um, but, but I, you know, I said to him once and I say to people often, like, like, like for me, especially the way I approach politics, I say like, it's not about you. Like by and large politics is about people like organizing and lobbying for their, for their group interest. Um, however, my ideal metamodern politics, like, and the reason that it's eco-socialist 
is because it's mm -hmm. actually advocating for other people and for the planet, which we are systemically kind of undermining and eroding, right? So things like healthcare, right? Like if you already have healthcare and you already have kind of a job and income, if you're a selfish person, you're not necessarily going to politically campaign for those things, right? No, you it might, would be natural. Yeah, yeah. You might be conservative and you might campaign mm -hmm. for things to stay the same for the status mm -hmm. quo. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, not, not to insult anybody in particular. This is how a lot of people approach politics, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, yeah, I'm, I understand who I, think profile. Is, who I think is attractive, who I think is going to, mm -hmm. you know, keep things the yes. same, how I like it. Yes. However, right, I, what I'm saying is like, <clears throat> politics is not about you anymore or me. It's about mm. the big picture. It's about getting everybody on this planet, universal mm. healthcare, because it's a human right, universal education, because it's a human right. <clears throat> so we have the logistics to provide for these things. Mm. What we don't have is the kind of public discourse and political will right because because you know historically right the voices of progress like martin luther king right mm. malcolm x right in, in the cases mm. of race especially but more broadly economic justice they mm. are suppressed they are murdered they are you know demonized and and their legacies are tarnished and hijacked and co-opted right so this process never stopped it continues mm. on a daily basis. The regimes reproduce themselves mm. through our identities and through our micro actions. So a metamodernist would actually really try to, you know, ex extricate themselves from all these systems of power, but then mm. re reinsert into them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and mm. ad advocate for what has to be done. Mm. So That's interesting. Why, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, change people's, uh, you know, you know, proclivities, like I want you to be a conservative, if that's what if that's what you want, but you want you as a conservative can advocate for your version of eco socialism, th that is also universal, right? So mm, we, can, mm. we, we, can, we can we can agree and we can build consensus on that point, because mm -hmm. it's not about us. It's about how can we mm, mm, you mm. Know, distribute the benefits of civilization. So we can actually yes. sustain civilization because we're, yeah. we're on a path of collapse. There's a, there's a couple things you said there that I'm, I'm not, it's not resonating with me, but I, I actually don't, I don't think I want to address that so much. There, there's a few words I do want to address. I think we, uh, it's a good direction to go in. You mentioned uh, heroes mm -hmm. a bit earlier uh, and kind of this heroic type of, of, of character uh, in history. Uh, and, I, and I guess you mentioned that as kind of admiration for, for kind of going forward. Um, and you also mentioned power and I kind of wanted jump off of those two things and maybe we can, I do want to come back to Bernie Sanders uh, and this nationalizing and, and things like that uh, after we talk about this. Um, I've written some notes, hopefully we can, we can do that. Because, you know, part of this, um, this metamodernism is kind of this romantic aesthetic for me. It, it is not, uh, and I, oh, I know you're a big fan of the Marvel movies. Is, am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're also, they're, they're, they're telling this hero story. And I know you, yeah. you really want to animate this type of being in the world. Uh, yeah. To, you know, because I think you are a guy who feels a lot of these crises, you know, maybe the meta crises as Zach Stein talks about or whatever. Uh, so yeah, you need heroes to rise to the occasion to do that. Um, but you know, for me, I just have to say, like, I, I really despise those, those, those Marvel movies. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> I, the, that, that, that's the, fine. You know, I, I have some, I have some hero, things to the say. The hero aesthetic about, does, yeah. and it's not because it's the explosion, Michael Bay yeah. style. It's not that critique. It's this hero aesthetic. It doesn't resonate with me. I have to say, uh -huh, I, you sure. know, as a romantic, I see sure. the world in much more like dark greens and dark reds. And this is why I'm really, you know, I've already mentioned this, but just to put it in this context. Uh, in this kind of narrative storytelling context, you know, it's much more why I'm about not escalating the discussion to a point where we need these championing heroes. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I respect your position. I'm just telling you what I'm feeling and where I come from. It's, I'm sure. much more interested in having this deep discussion between sure. people, you know, to bring out all of those nuances so that we can also, you know, kind of come, become comfortable with those nuances. I don't see the world in such 
in such black and white cartoonish that I, that, and and you know it, yeah and 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 all, you know it's kind of like Nietzsche you know beyond good and evil that that definitely yeah, resonated yeah, with me yeah. when I read that statement but but also there there is another point here that I just want to say about you know my experiences maybe it'll help people understand where I'm coming from you know this this object that this metaphysical object called free will you know most people would not doubt that they have that you know, it's like, well, that's how things get done. But what is interesting, like, I don't find that description, like, it doesn't resonate with anything that I feel. I, uh, coming back to that kind of lust and kind of the phenomena of the world is kind of what pulls me towards it. I feel a bit more like a slave to the, the passion of the, of the world. Does that make sense? It's yeah, speaking yeah. very romantically. But again, these words resonate with me more and they may lead to similar types of action you say well so what if you're pulled to the action or whether you think it's your will putting into action what does it matter but i think it has a lot to do with you know the aesthetic of the narrative and i've said it a few times now about what is the aesthetic of the meta modern narrative how you know are we going to tell a story of totalitarianism is it a global narrative or is it a local narrative is it about going deep you know this is debatable and i think I bring it up in conversation with you because I think it might be a point where we're, we are different and it's interesting because it's different. Yeah, dude, <laughs> maybe yeah. you want to jump off of that. Yeah, sure. I think, I think what you were saying about free will <clears throat> is like you're bored with the philosophical discussion because the question is not whether there's free will or not. The question is, what do we do with it? <laughs> Right. Is that, is that correct? Um, well, That's kind of I don't how want to I get too it. much into okay. free will, but, yeah. but uh, yeah, I, I think I just don't think it doesn't, it's not an object that I can experience. I'm much more just pulled into things by sure. the phenomenon of experience. Sure. It's, it's quite related to kind of object oriented uh, ontology, you know? Yeah. There's a uh, obstruction, there's uh, a breakdown in my experience and I'm, pulled to then fix that, you know, or address it in whatever way, call yeah. it beautiful or whatever I want to do. It's, yeah. it's kind of related to this, you know, I'm a Heideggerian. So that's yeah. probably no surprise, this object oriented <laughs> ontology. Yeah. Anyway, that's what I would say. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I, I could talk a lot about the, the Marvel cinematic universe. Um, okay. And I'm in a kind of difficult spot because I think, you know, conservatives hate it typically, but also mm, kind of, mm -hmm. kind of leftists dislike it. Right. Mm. And so I'm kind of in between that, right. Like um, mm -hmm. with, with the, with these films, because, you know, there's also, you know, there's their, their mythology, right. Their, their mm -hmm. contemporary mythology. And, you know, and interestingly, you know, these characters go back several generations. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they were birthed in print and kind of, you know, kind of took root in the kind of uh, like, like psyche collective psyche of people because they effectively replace like the pantheon of gods of the ancient world right and they also you know in a kind of contemporary sense like ask big what ifs you know they try to bring mm -hmm. it down to reality like what if there was like a you know person with this power or that power and what mm. would they what would they do with it so it, it invokes all these questions of of will and justice and you know truth mm -hmm. and everything um but it's interesting but, i i do like superman you know when, uh, when okay they, yeah when, when they, that conservative when, hero <laughs> no 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 but listen to the reason why I, I i wasn't even gonna play i'm talking about this but i think it's kind of interesting now that you yeah. mentioned it because i really like when superman like humanity is scared of him because yeah. he has too much power yeah. So now, you know, his, pro his power is also his problem. And I really right. like, see, that's, that's, a yeah. bit, that's not just your black and white good evil. It's now a problem yeah. that you have to deal. And that, that feels much deeper and it resonates yeah. with me more. I think that was yeah. Superman versus Batman. I did like that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. The DC universe, you know, has way more resonance with conservative people. Um, hmm, interesting. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if this if this if this uh, applies to you, but Superman is kind of like a Jesus Christ character, mm. and and also your initials are JC. So yeah, you know, I I've think always said I have a lot to live up to because <laughs> there's Jesus Christ, there's Julius Caesar, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. There's some synchronicity there. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I like I like all of it, and you know, I like I like thinking about it critically too. Like I used to really like Batman. Mm -hmm. until I started seeing critiques about how it's kind of like really conservative, like, mm -hmm. like Batman is this billionaire, you know, who becomes a vigilante 
Like it's totally anti like welfare state and social justice, right? It's like, I, and so, it, so yeah. look at, look at the, look at the paradox here though. I was attracted to it as a child because, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't know the difference. I think we're pulled in all sorts of different directions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it took me a long time, like to actually recontextualize it and you know i can still enjoy like the batman films but they're but they just appear mm -hmm. ridiculous to me now mm -hmm. whereas all of the marvel cinematic universe like stan lee himself you know made it about social justice right mm -hmm. so you know when when people overreact and are like oh it's like sjw propaganda like mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're not projecting like it's true but the, they don't know what that actually means or meant to stan lee you know mm -hmm. or meant to actual disenfranchised people mm -hmm. and um you know like take take the take the x-men films for example like the first one was directed by brian singer like he he's gay and you know he like the film like was clearly kind of like you know, paralleling how mutants are like, you know, alienated or discriminated people in our contemporary society, mm -hmm. right? Just mm -hmm. people who are different. And that's, that's, that's wrong, right? That's some fucked up shit. Mm -hmm. And so these superhero movies, like if they're done right, and I think those were done right, at least the first two, the, the, the rest of them are quite different, but, but they, they speak to that. They speak to that cause and that human nature and then the Marvel films, like, so I wanted to say, I think for people to really appreciate them, there's some criteria that has to be met, right? And you can totally view them critically. Like, like I, like to, I like to love them, but also view them critically. Like I said, the leftists kind of also dismiss them because they think it's just, it's just popcorn entertainment and fantasy and we need to get real, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. the struggles of Captain America are not the struggles of really ordinary people right mm -hmm. who can't who can't pay their bills i mean that is true for spider-man to some extent but not you know that's not actually an issue in the marvel spider in the marvel cinematic universe spider-man because he's kind of taken care of by tony stark right so so um where was i going with that um yeah so i would say why they you know, resonate critically with you yeah and also for yeah. people for people to get into it you have to mm -hmm. actually watch all of them and watch them in, in order because i remember for like you know the first few years right the like phase one and phase two like mm -hmm. even though they were successful right right from the get-go they were successful nobody was like sure on where it was going on how it all tied together but what happens when you watch them all is is uh, i think very meta modern themes start to start to crop up mm. like one off the top is like you know the, the the directing pair the russo brothers who directed four of the films i mentioned this in the russia talk okay. that, that they they also directed episodes of community which is described mm. as a meta modern kind of sitcom mm. okay, I've not seen it. so you know there's lots of different art, artistic and cinematic aesthetics of but maybe just to make it interesting why can you explain a bit why that why it's metamodern why that, community that why community is metamodern yeah, or, or just that director if he's if all yeah. of his material have a touch of meta metamodern yeah sure what is, what is so, it exactly so in terms of community mm. it's very it's meta humor right there's a lot of mm. like there's a lot of there's a lot of meta jokes and kind of meta storylines right mm -hmm. like it's 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 implicit but it's also explicit right mm -hmm. and so people pick up on this you know um so it's very it's just very meta and then with the marvel films like that doesn't quite make it meta modern though at least not in my book <laughs> um yeah i mean it's i think okay. it's a i think it's a decent baseline like for okay. in, in my kind of experience like like the meta turn in film like does begin in the 90s like there's kind of mm -hmm. met, like seinfeld is kind of meta humor uh, mm -hmm. But before that, everything was. I love quite, Seinfeld. Yeah, before that, everything was quite <laughs> postmodern, right? Like we, like there's, you know, always meta around, but it didn't become mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. kind of pronounced until the 90s. Okay. 
Yeah, maybe it would help if you kind of described how I've kind of pictured it through this romantic narrative of my metamodernism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm struggling because I'm not quite sure yeah. the, the group of aesthetic that you're talking about here. Maybe yeah, it's quite broad. I I, I yeah, couldn't, yeah I couldn't list it all off the top of my head, no. but but you know, Seinfeld I, got me thinking a bit. Yeah, I kind of got a touch of it. I've written about the X Files too. I don't know if you're a fan mm, of the X Files. That to me is completely postmodern. Um. Maybe, but but okay. there's one there's one episode in particular that I focused mm -hmm. on in my in my article, um, and I also kind of unpacked the meta mythology because it's very like super hybrid, you know, super mm -hmm. hybridity is a kind of meta modern term, and there's just a lot of you know a lot going on there, and there's this idea of conspirituality, which was coined in 2011, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the melding of conspiracy with like new age spiritual narratives. Right. So these things kind of were somewhat historically distinct and kind of converged over mm -hmm. the past decades. And there's mm -hmm. lots of kind of examples of this. And so so X-Files was early kind of late postmodernism, early metamodernism, particularly in one episode that was all like very mm -hmm. meta meta humor and very mm -hmm. recursive uh, storylines. And another person on YouTube kind of did a video about this. So I kind of built some of my argument off of that. Mm -hmm. And so um yeah it's meta it's metafictional you know there's there's terms mm -hmm. here to dive into and kind of unpack okay. what's meant there but i want to return to the yeah, marvel yeah, the marvel yeah. films okay they, they constructed this like 22 <clears throat> 23 film like integrated arc right <clears throat> and it's very meta in the sense that like each film has its own arc and then there's arcs connecting those and then there's lots of callbacks right so it becomes this this integrated synthetic kind of meta narrative right mm -hmm. and and not only that like there's a lot i could say about that but the the particular <laughs> storyline that they chose and that they they finished with the the so-called infinity saga was i mean it really resonates with me because it was about tony stark being a kind of kind of architect of the military industrial complex having mm -hmm. a meta, having a metanoia right in, mm -hmm. the, in the first film like repenting for his for his his war profiteering and doing a mm -hmm. completely complete transformation just in that film but then that past continues to haunt him all throughout mm -hmm. the all throughout the whole saga mm -hmm. and it and 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 he continues to grow as a person and say well, i'm trying to end war so we can retire right mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the whole the whole narrative is about mm -hmm. building up to the end game right the mm -hmm. end game and that narrative tracks with what we're seeing with climate change, right? So there's parallels between like Thanos and climate change being this kind of existential threat based on our overconsumption, mm. right? And let me just clarify, like, like Thanos is kind of an oversimplified villain, you know? Like he just wants to kill half of all life and whatever. And, you know, they don't, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't build that out much. However, mm -hmm. there, are, there are other films with much more complex villains and much more complex mm -hmm. tensions. Like, mm -hmm. like, uh, case in point, that, that, like, that, uh, that, that kind of satisfy that same one. Cause I'm thinking of like, mm -hmm. um, the oh, crap, that British movie. I can't remember what it was called. The, the Kingsman. Oh the, yeah. I yeah. thought the villains were very similar, but that Kingsman did it better. Was, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, often in films, you know, villains are oversimplified, right. Mm -hmm. And people appreciate complex torn, torn characters and, you know, there's a, there's great examples in the Marvel universe. There's, um, Bucky as Captain America's best friend and he, he becomes a kind of like pr programmed assassin right to do things he doesn't want to do and then so the conflict is like how to save him and then that becomes the 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 chief conflict in kind of Captain America's civil war because Bucky is like between being a villain and a and a and a hero and Captain America is trying to save him Iron Man's trying to kill him because Bucky killed his parents so there's all these like complex, like, like rationales for who people are. And then it generates a, an authentic conflict as opposed to a, a contrived kind of storyline like Superman versus Batman. Sorry that you like it, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's, not as, it's not as deep. And then one other example, a good one is Black Panther, right? So the bad guy in Black Panther is this Killmonger dude who was, you know, grew up in the ghetto in America and his father was killed by the, by the Black Panther because the father was trading weapons. He was, deal, he was dealing weapons, right? 
in order for like a black uprising. And so, so that's, that, that story is nested in actual historical kind of truth where there's like, there's slavery, you know, in American history, and then, you know, continued oppression and disenfranchisement of black people and other minorities. And then that leads to a kind of criminalization and over policing of their communities. And so, you know, Killmonger is, is, is rationally motivated just like his, his father to kind of take justice into his own hands, you know? And then, so the, the whole conflict in the movie is like Killmonger versus Black Panther. They both have a kind of legitimate claim to the throne and, you know, really, really fucked up um, kind of uh, internal conflicts. And then in the end, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Black Panther wins, but, but mm -hmm. Killmonger's death is like very tragic and bittersweet, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a real. I haven't seen this movie, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, to really understand, you have to you have to see this film, mm -hmm. and you'll have to see the whole kind of Marvel Cinematic Universe mm -hmm. and see how it all hangs together, because because mm -hmm. you know many of the heroes get their own kind of you know one-off pieces or trilogies, but then they all come together in the end, and they 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 mm -hmm. come apart many times, right? Mm -hmm. And then they come back together and apart and together, and so it's just it's amazing to take it all in on that level. And with any mm -hmm. art, with any cinema, whether it's whether it's cartoons or or biopics, or superheroes, you know, you have to read between the lines, right? Mm -hmm. You have to view it critically. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. Where I like, like I like reading <clears throat> books on like the philosophy of the Matrix or the or the philosophy of like superheroes, mm -hmm. because um, this uh, gets gets into our you know our psyche and our subconscious. Uh, and 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 deep history of mythology and you know gods and heroes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes it becomes a very spiritual kind of narrative and a very like mm -hmm. eschatological like, end of the world type stuff, right? And mm -hmm. to return that point, and I'll throw it back to you. Like mm -hmm. the the films really resonated me more and more as as they as they came out because of the the really you know um, kind of hyperbolic framing of the end game you know mm -hmm. and and that we have to be heroic in our own ways and and act together to overcome that said evil right the mm -hmm. evil of, mm -hmm. of the evil of thanos um yeah. and then in the end you know bringing it back to, to the jesus mo moment tony stark mm -hmm. sacrifices himself and in a way mm -hmm. this is kind of like like foreseen and preordained by things that happened before so there's a certain destiny to it and it's it's tragic because you know at the critical moment without being told what to do um he he sacrifices himself and you know saves the world and uh you know we can move on to the next kind of conflict hopefully a a, a smaller one but but um <clears throat> yeah you know it's about it's about climate change it's about like yeah, I can understand that with the with the populations yeah. dying. Yeah, I can. You're, you're, I understand yeah. the analogy. You're right in the <clears throat> sense that like superhero stories are totally disconnected from people's everyday reality. But these films mm -hmm. are incredibly commercially and critically successful mm -hmm. because yeah. they resonate with people who take the time to process it, and they see in those hero stories aspects of their own life and challenges. Yeah, but it's not because they're so disconnected that I that I find that uh, I don't like them. For example, and this is going to be bad because I haven't seen the movie, so I might be totally off base here, but just hear out my logic. The logic is sound. <laughs> like you'd mentioned Kilroy in the, in the Black Panther movie. Like, yeah, and Killmonger. He, 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 yeah, Killmonger. He, he had to die and the hero yeah. had to win. Yeah. And this is where it doesn't feel metamodern to me because sure. For me, it would it should have been oh they 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 have a higher level discussion. Yeah, I agree. I but, agree. I agree. But, I agree. But this is where the hero. This again, I already said this, but the hero <laughs> villain narrative doesn't feel meta modern to me because yeah. we need to come together and discuss. Yes. In order to reach a resolve. So for me, I it, completely it, agree. I completely agree. Yeah. And this is. It would have been a terrible movie. I mean, yeah. who wants to see that movie? But this is why it's the wrong paradigm, I would say. Yeah. So I grant that it's not all up to the standard of what we want metamodernism to be. I, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% with you there. And I'm glad we found this kind of touch point because, like I say, especially with like Thanos, you know, I'd like to see more, more dialogue 
you know, more challenging. Yeah, you wanted them to be robust. Yeah. Yeah. I get and there's that. lots yeah. of, so this is a, this is, <clears throat> this is a, a point where we can go beyond the films to the metamodern culture because, because I'm working <clears throat> on an essay about this too. So I'm not, I'm not just <clears throat> pulling it out of my butt. These are some things I've been thinking about. Oh, um, there's a, there's a YouTube response to all of these films, <clears throat> right? There's, <clears throat> there's, 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 du- there's countless video essays that 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 deconstruct and reconstruct the the narratives beautifully and if you just watch some of those like like in little Mm. 10 or 15 20 minute chunks i think you'll be drawn in more yeah um but there's also like like you know meta humor mocking the films itself right like it's kind of endless like you can take a nearly Mm. perfect product like star wars and then you can turn it on its head and spoof it with space balls yeah, 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 you know. So I love when people do this, right? Yes, I, yeah, I love yeah. when they they critique the 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 Marvel films with this kind of meta modern spirit. Yeah. yeah. Um. And uh. Yeah. I I would love to see. And so I'm agreeing with you that I want to see the the heroes and villains actually like hash it out and like uh have conflict resolution you know um but but <laughs> sounds stupid but from from the from the writer's point of view especially if you're a good writer and you're writing strong characters like like Killmonger and like like Bucky Captain America's friend like just like in real life we are kind of like like bounded into certain tracks and certain interests and priorities and they come into conflict with each other so i'm with you that ideally we would overcome mm-hmm. it but from a writer's point of view you have to kind of resolve the initial <clears throat> tension as as best you can and sometimes <laughs> sometimes like in the case of killmonger like killmonger mm-hmm. would not stop right he wanted to kill black panther right yeah, so so I, in, I the, in the in the yeah. hero context it becomes this <laughs> argument of just self defense right like yeah, like black I, black panther didn't want to kill him but he kind of got forced to to kill him so this is as as writers this is almost like the best we can do um but I think it's just yeah. the hero paradigm that I'm yeah. reflecting on. I, and my, yeah. just, I, I, my argument is it's the wrong paradigm for metamodernism. Sure. But, um, you know, and again, the Superman thing, he's de- his own identity is the conflict and he can't get out of it. There's nothing he can do. His power is a danger to the people and, you know, it, all, it could yeah. be a benefit. Or, so I like, you know, I, I've always liked these more psychological movies, you know, that deal with a psychological problem that your very existential position uh, is is the conflict right it's it's a different type of narrative and of course people are okay to have their opinions but this more i don't know i call it complex because it's not hero villain black white it feels more meta modern to me it can lead to a a meta solution at the end whereas instead killmonger has to die for example but you, you i want to say something about you talked about people's interpretation of the marvel movies this I love, like exegesis in general. Like, yeah. you know, even, you know, I read a lot of guys, you know, half the philosophical texts I read are just, and the good ones are just people digesting the ancients, but giving yeah. it a new interpretation. You know, this, right. this, this space that opens up uh, an interpretation is really beautiful. Even if, you know, people critique the, you know, Christians for this, doing this to the Bible. I, I think it's a, it's a really good, uh, medium, you know, vehicle in order to have that kind of ecstatic, coming off Heideggerian language, this ecstatic moment where you can identify who you are as, and, and who you are to your phenomena, who you are with your people. So I really appreciate this. So, uh, I mean, when you said that, I just want to reflect on that. That was, yeah, I could, cool. w- without having the, seen the meta modern movies, without having, you know, read these, yeah. this uh, uh, culture that spins off of it, I can imagine it's really good. Uh, as a, as a, almost a psychological uh, exercise for people, it's almost yeah. like what we're doing here with this movie. Yeah. We're almost like doing a meta modern movie review here, and we're kind of yeah. exercising what I'm talking about. I think it's a great practice. I'm, you know. Yeah, and I think um, you know, I'm gonna publish an essay at some point, but I, you know, and I hope I can kind of make some appeals to both leftists and conservatives ab- about the films, like not just as entertainment, but as kind of uh, substantive things. But, <clears throat> but um, there's enough, let's say, diversity within the Marvel universe, especially, right? Because it's so, it's so built out versus the DC universe. You can yeah. go into it and I'm certain you will find a hero that you identify with just like you like Superman. 
you know? And so each person like for different reasons, right? Whether you're, whether you're a female or whether you're, you're black, like with Black Panther, like maybe you gravitate towards certain heroes more than mm. others. Right. And so for me, um, I kind of, um, you know, relate to the Hulk a lot, <laughs> which, <laughs> which may not surprise people, but, um, <laughs> But you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting stuff there to unpack, right? I mean, I also I, I also love Spider Man. I identify with Spider Man. Yeah. Like it's you know you. It's just so funny, Brett, because you <laughs> you know online you have a completely different personality when I see you typing things. And if I think of that, Brett, then I think of yeah. the Hulk because you can get angry yeah. and, and hold your yeah. ground. But when I talk to you in person, it's then yeah. you're Bruce Banner, maybe. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, Hulk, Hulk's gonna get mad when people are shooting at him. <laughs> you know, he's gonna he's gonna turn into a green monster who's bulletproof so fitting <laughs> so uh yeah you know i've been i've been kind of embracing mm. that character through the integral left circles mm. you know like um like mm. the the growing down podcast i did with those guys right those are those mm -hmm. are my those are my uh that's my superhero team <laughs> they mm -hmm. they each kind of identify with different characters more as well but but um yeah, there's a way in for everybody. I mean, I recommend do, watching these YouTube videos of the video essays. Sometimes I do, mm -hmm. I watch them just for like, like, like catharsis or like kind of to get, to get a little fix because it's mm -hmm. basically just clips from the films with people talking over it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, yeah, it's like nice free entertainment, but yeah. you can, you can, you can do that. But mm -hmm. also to get the full context, you'd have to like start watching them from the beginning from Iron Man. And then, you know, there's missteps. The Hulk, which was the second film, is actually quite bad. You know, it, it critically mm, bombed. Yeah, it, had remember, a different, yeah. it had a different actor, Ed, Edward... Um, uh, Edward Norton. Edward Norton, yeah, who's a great yeah. actor. But, you know, I just think it wasn't, wasn't the right cast and, and, mm. and, and direction for that film. And so, you know, the, the producers recognized that and they switched mm. it up. And so the whole series isn't perfect. And, and especially towards the end, towards the end game, it gets increasingly kind of ridiculous and, and meta and like, you know, kind of jumping the shark and having plot holes. Mm. But you have to kind of love mm. it in all its flaws, too, because I, I do think it, it, it at least reflects metamodern culture, if not aspires to a kind of metamodern politics that, that, that we point towards. But it, it falls short as well. And at the end of my side view, I say, you know, I say like all these metamodernisms are also failed projects. Like it's not, mm. you know, it's, it's descriptive of different things, but it's failing to intervene and actually change the world. Mm. So it's, um, you know, this is where we get back to the romantic aspect of it. Like, like Nietzsche, you know, was very ill-fated, uh, but very idealistic and romantic you know mm -hmm. and uh -huh. and and he and he like marx and other great thinkers like left a huge mm -hmm. impact on the world mm -hmm. um even though they died like poor and disrespected <laughs> and all these things right mm -hmm. so you know we're aiming at a project beyond us um and it's a kind of like spiritual religious you know mm -hmm. struggle mm -hmm. over over human history Mm -hmm. um, and with the with the convergence of all these things like climate change and and mm -hmm. and protests and you know the planetary limits essentially mm -hmm. um you know we're we're running back we're 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 coming back into like the age of biblical proportions and you know mm -hmm. like uh mm -hmm. really shadowological end times type stuff like plagues and locusts and floods and wildfires and so you know <laughs> there's one thing that, you said that uh, right there's one thing that you said that, that redeemed it for a bit for me this marvel cinematic universe and you said that there's, mm -hmm. a, there's probably a, a character a hero yeah somewhere in that universe that you can identify with and you, you almost had me with that i have to admit because i, yeah, I, I I'm, yeah i'm, I'm not gonna, gonna but let me i'm let not me gonna pick for to you i'm not gonna pick for you you can <laughs> But, yeah, but it was kind of interesting because I, I, I thought, well, yeah, if that's the case, then, then all of a sudden we are sharing a universe where everyone can be a hero. That's the narrative, right? Yeah. But then I came back on it a bit. And I'm going to get a bit philosophical here now, and I didn't know I was going to go here. But, but I think it has to do, the reason I'm coming back on it a bit 
is both uh, metaphys- I have metaphysical reasoning for it and also kind of the, the, the kind of historical temporal situation. Let's see if I can describe this. Because I think that the, the reason I don't like all of this escalation of identity, I, 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 I shy away from it because I, it shies me away from that deeper conversation, but it has to do with the way I see uh, you know, identification happening in the first place. You know, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I very much prescribe to this kind of metaphysical subject that is, that is kind of metaphysical in as much as it is there before any physiological, any physical, any biological description. And this, the constitution of this entity is made, it, it is made just in its kind of, it, you know, it's dealing with its environment. You know, it's, it's, it's this more object ontology I referenced earlier, right? Comes from Heidegger, ultimately. There's, there is this, this subject, object, that is kind of weaving and dealing. It's dealing with its environment. And through, through that dealing, it had, there's a breakdown moment or, or there's a joyous moment. It can go either way. But then the, the, the moment climaxes ecstatically in the moment and produces, you know, it kind of presences the objects that we then have. And whether they're physical or biological, whatever, you know, whatever description we come to then comes secondarily to this metaphysical subject who we can't really talk about, know anything about because we're always thinking cognitively. It's kind of this epistemic versus this ontologic uh, two realms here. So there's, there's this understanding coupled with kind of where I see the United States is at. Now, can be kind of coming back didn't plan to come here and just said it coming back to the condition <clears throat> in the United States because I want to get past all of this I do I want to get past all of this this epistemic identification and get to that ecstatic uh, climaxing moment where we can collectively identify each other you know thinking of using that kind of and it, we may be far away I get that you know but this is why the kind of this raising of this tension a different, it's a different approach than raising the attention to get attention on it. And I hear you championing for the one, but it, you know, but okay, maybe I'm coming from the right, you know, so I've got this other perspective, but this is how I would, I would propose that we meet each other in the moment in that extent and create some kind of new identity just from the, the very way that we're working with each other. Because when I look at America right now, what I see is, you know, we're not working together very well. We're, we're, a, we're, a, bunch of people debating race is who is what is what the American identity is at, at this ecstatic moment. Well, is that who we want to be? No, of course, nobody wants to be there. So I, I'm, I'm much more about nurturing these more safe environments for listening, intimacy, all of the stuff I already mentioned. I don't know where I was going with that, but I, I needed to say there was that metaphysical understanding, how it plays into it, why I take that dial, that, that kind of understanding up in this very moment. I think it's a, it's a very healthy uh, perspective to have. Yeah. I mean, so I think we could find a lot of common cause and common ground. The problem when it comes to the politics of it is indeed the people kind of, you know, on both sides of who's in power, right? The Republicans and Democrats Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are, are talking past each other and they're mm. largely both passing legislation that hurts people, hurts ordinary people. And hey, the, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good because most, <clears throat> yes. I think, I think uh, most Republicans, let's say, don't agree with that. They, they still mm. love Trump, even though Trump and mm. the, what Trump kind of represents is undercutting mm. their foundation. Right. Mm-hmm. If there is poor white people who are disenfranchised and Trump mm-hmm. is saying, oh, I'm going to help you. I'm for you. <laughs> and they're believing him. But in truth, mm-hmm. uh, he's not. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Yeah. we have a we have a major, major <clears throat> uh, kind of paradox here and kind of clusterfuck yes. because, you know, coming back to this 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 point of common ground, like mm-hmm. in your own version you you were advocating for a kind of eco socialism, right? And so and, and mm. to bring it back to the metaphysics and, mm-hmm. and and triple O, like, you know, we can have a huge diversity of people. But what is you know, in terms of identity, in terms of <clears throat> other other things, and we can also like seek a common identity, kind of humanism, right, for everyone. Mm-hmm. But but we can't like structurally, environmentally provide that 
unless you actually like institutionally yeah yes some baselines for people right so coming back I, to free health care no. right yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. the most powerful <clears throat> republicans and and democrats mm -hmm. for, for whatever twisted reasons that they can mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. against free health care they're against mm -hmm. universal mm -hmm. single-payer health care right mm -hmm. and then the debates get hung up on <clears throat> on, on on the words and stuff right blah blah, mm -hmm. blah. So what we need is like real tipping points, right? So mm -hmm. there's already a kind of majority that are for Medicare for all, but we need mm -hmm. those conservatives to like step up and, you know, advocate for Bernie Sanders and tune mm -hmm. out of Fox News and, and Bill O'Reilly and stuff and, <laughs> and, and Candace Owens, like the people that are incredibly influential, right? Like we're mm -hmm. talking about our like thousand followers, right? Like Candace yeah. Owens and, and all these other reactionaries have millions millions of people millions mm -hmm. of people are watching their videos and, and mm -hmm. listening to their <laughs> to their diatribes and it's like mm -hmm. um yeah that's you know yeah me metamodernism has to overcome mm -hmm. these sorts of you know cultural paradoxes and here and here brent here's where we start to really align <clears throat> and i'm going to say where we align and then i'm going to try and diverge it to make it interesting again um, because I agree with you when I'm talking about have, having that, that nurturing environment, you know, in, in this book I'm writing, I'm talking about nurturing truth, the di disclosure of truth and an environment where authenticity is liberated. You know, I, I'm taking up liberalism, liberty from the authenticity perspective. So I, you know, I, this is where we, we do converge because I say some of the conditions for that are not having to have some kind of financial burden looming over you. You know, I live yeah. here in Denmark. I've spent three quarters of my life in America, one quarter of my life in Denmark now. And, you know, I've got American, a lot of American friends here. And they're like, you know, when I went to go have my daughter, it was so liberating. You know, yeah. I, didn't have to I didn't have to worry about walking out of the hospital thinking, what does this do to my insurance policy? You know, wh yeah. what did they get? You know, what do they get me for kind of a talk? You know, that is completely obstructing yeah. your life from what it should have been, which was a beautiful moment with your family, right? So I'm totally on you with this. It's, it's, yeah. This is where we need to get political. And I think that's yeah. why we resonate with metamodernism because, man, we've talked about movies for a little while. And we're, we're clearly, I actually didn't know this about you. We cl clearly both have this artistic uh, aesthetic attunement, but we also have the political. And now I like that we're going this direction. But the thing that I want to say to kind of diverge a bit, make it interesting again and let you respond, because I've just been agreeing with you now, is <laughs> no, I think- let's keep uh, it there. <laughs> yeah, no, but let's make it interesting. Yeah, go ahead. We'll, 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 cl we'll conclude and wrap it up in a, in a together point. Um, Try to, uh, but you know, I, I want to say that I was, I am not for Bernie Sanders and this was your whole platform. So, you know, you think, man, Brent and Justin are like diametrically opposed now and Justin's for national nationalizing things like healthcare, you know, having more social infrastructure. So what's going on there? But it's because I believe the United States is not ready for that. I think that there are some other conditions when I'm talking about those conditions that need to be met for those, for that institution to be put in place. And I think, you know, contrasting Denmark to the United States, there is a lot more trust in the society here where I'm speaking from. And there, there's no trust to the government in the States. There's, there's no, uh, there's too much tension between the races. You know, clearly that's what we're seeing with the civil unrest. There, it's not a safe environment where someone is willing to put in their money to a communal, uh, communal project like nationalized healthcare or whatever. It's not going to work. I, you know, again, I play both sides or three sides or all four sides. And I talk to the people on the right and I get along with them quite well. Cause I know where they're coming from. You know, those old Bill O'Reilly guys, they're never going to go for it. You know, it's going to divide the country even further. And this is where I champion for animating a localization of governance, because if a localized governance wants to put it in, in place, it could then, it could make sense there. And maybe it, maybe it spreads to other places. I don't know. I just see a place like Denmark, you know, it's, there's much more, uh, uh, you know, it's much more uh, um, homogenous here. And, and it, it, it right. works better because of that. And I think that's the condition that we need America to find itself in. So maybe you want to respond to that. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't, I don't really see the conflict like, like in terms of, 
you know, the, the localization uh, can be, you know, highlighted for, for certain things, right? Like, mm-hmm. but, but things like healthcare, like not only should they be nationalized, like it should be globalized, <laughs> you know, like yeah. really. But I'm keeping the temporal aspect in here. You know, what are people mm-hmm. ready to take on? You yeah. Know, you, and, you can't so, just go, a lot of what you're doing is you just want to, you know, you want to go for it now. Clean yeah. slate. Everybody has it. And yeah. I'm thinking not if people are ready for it. Yeah. We have to do to, what, what is right. I wanted to address that because. Yeah. You know, there's, there's some, there's some validity to all of that. However, I hear this argument a lot and I think it's mm-hmm. just, it's just a cop out. Okay. Like, like, like there's some truth to it in the sense, like, you know, there, there's a, there's a white supremacy kind of background to all of this. Right. And it's, you know, mm-hmm. it's large, it's largely invisible, right. It's not mm-hmm. just about the KKK. It's like the, the structural ra- racism, right. It's very mm-hmm. complex, but mm-hmm. um. <clears throat> you know, there's that kind of background. And so, yeah, I'm for kind of accelerating progress if possible, but there is a sense that, you know, history, you know, has its kind of blowback and backlashes to good and bad things, you know, so it's kind of unpredictable in that sense. And, you know, we mm-hmm. can, you know, clearly the, the, the States is, is behind the times and it's not mm-hmm. ready for its socialist revolution. However, like I reject that sort of as a cop-out, because mm-hmm. like, yeah. because t- just taking the logic of it, right? Like, are you saying that America was ready for Trump? Like, and, and there's some truth to that mm-hmm. too, right? Yeah, I, I would say like, it was yeah, ready. Yeah, Definitely. I mean, that's what they, yeah. that's what the people chose, yeah. right? Yeah. However, however, when it comes to us as, as intellectuals and kind of sense makers of it all, like mm-hmm. none of these things are set in stone, right? Like Trump has had a kind of career trajectory that, that, that is easy to study. And, you know, he's, he's been rich, uh, white collar criminal his whole life, basically, and entertainer, you know, he walks this, mm-hmm. walks this line and d- does whatever he can to make money. Um, and, you know, he, he transmuted that into, uh, into, uh, into a presidency for whatever reason. And there was obviously some poetic justice in him wrecking what existed of the, of the, of the Republican status quo. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, that was like a optimistic horizon for a while. People love to mm-hmm. see it. And he was bashing the media and the media was playing in, you know, playing to his tune. And, and he also, you know, uh, defeated Hillary Clinton, who a lot of people hated, including, including myself. Like she did not mm-hmm. represent a kind of progressive edge. Right. And so it turns out that the world wasn't ready for her either. Um, so, but I, I think it's a little too sort of retroactive to mm-hmm. say like like you know in 2016 the world wasn't ready for bernie in 2020 the world wasn't ready for bernie i mean mm-hmm. the platform is solid and if mm-hmm. we step back and look at how the mass media mainstream media framed the narrative you know whether we outsmart it or not it is influencing public discourse right so there's a vice documentary mm-hmm. that came out a few weeks ago bernie blackout Mm-hmm. None of this is new to me, but I think it's quite <laughs> revelatory for a lot of people. They need to see how systematically actually Bernie was demonized through media narratives. Mm-hmm. And there's a sense in which it's like, it's both systemic, but there's also individuals who in every word that they speak are at fault for contributing mm-hmm. to that, that suppression. Right. And mm-hmm. so, you know, is the world ready? I mean, that's mm-hmm. not really the question that I'm asking. It's yeah. certainly, a, certainly a valid kind of point of analysis, but we need to be careful how mm-hmm. we use it as a kind of ad hoc justification for what we yeah, think yeah, yeah. is going to happen or should happen. Because, yeah. you know, the, the, being a part of history is kind of, you know, about, you know, moving the needle and, and not knowing what's going to happen. But, you know, whether you're Bernie Sanders himself, you know, or someone more obscure like Ralph Nader, you know, mm-hmm. like you mm-hmm. have to try. We have to Mm -hmm. try. And because, you know, history is going to continue to be rewritten. Bad guys are going to be whitewashed. But also, you know, uh, better people are going to kind of, you know, take a revisionist approach. Right. And that's what I that's what I'm doing with metamodern theory, too. I'm not trying to, like, debunk what's been written. I'm trying to take a, a kind of meta frame of it, be a bit historically revisionist, say explicitly that a lot of kind of this discourse has been missed. It's, it's a missed opportunity. And, you know, 
now we're faced with this kind of paradox, right? This kind of false dilemma between Biden and Trump. And, you know, before you or anybody says, oh, the world's not ready for, for this or that, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. hold on a second here. Because I think as metamodernists at this point, you know, and as a leftist and a conservative, mm -hmm. we should be able to go beyond that. Like you should mm -hmm. be able to be anti-Trump and I should be able to be mm -hmm. an anti-Biden. Mm -hmm. And we should try to build a transpartisan, you know, transnational uh, coalition, grassroots, you know, kind of movement uh around eco-socialism that addresses climate change and, and dismantles the military industrial complex and also so there's all that and then i just wanted to to touch on one final point um mm -hmm. going back to something you said about about like healthcare and and kind of money and you know conservative opposition to it yeah yeah so there's there's many ways that it's like the financially smart thing to do, right? Like free healthcare is actually cheaper. It's cheaper to, to deploy, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and even that said, right? There's this question of like, oh, how are we gonna pay for it, right? So, so we need to like, you know, audit budgets and take away money, you know, tying it back to the protests and police brutality, this idea of defund the police, all of that militarization of the police should be completely defunded and abolished and then you free up all this money that can be spent mm -hmm. on social workers and healthcare and stuff so there's mm -hmm. that right there's just the mm -hmm. reallocation mm -hmm. of existing funds mm -hmm. which we mm -hmm. absolutely have enough to cover everything but then there's also the idea of like modern monetary theory right which is is kind of a leftist talking point but it's also something that the republicans are doing with the stimulus packages and it means the federal reserve can essentially just print money uh has a kind of relatively unlimited supply as long as it doesn't print too much and cause inflation, it can print as much money as it needs to pay for things like the Manhattan Project, you know, the Apollo Project, universal healthcare, universal education. So this is what Bernie Sanders' platform was built on. And he, mm -hmm. maybe he himself didn't do a good enough job, you know, marketing it. But again, he was up against the mass media. He was up against very intransigent publics who didn't want to change, you know, but that being said, his platform has the most widespread support. A majority of people support Medicare for all. A majority of people support drug legalization, all of these things. So, you know, politics aside, these are the things that have to happen. And these are the things that we need to advocate for through politics, through, through, mm -hmm. um, you know, through the different spheres as we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But when it comes back to the three spheres, like, Bernie Sanders might not appeal to everybody, but this is the, the bare minimum of moving forward. And then from that, Democrats and Republicans really have to do some serious um, critical reflection and reform. You know, if they want to continue to exist in one form or another, they need to evolve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's direly apparent, given the two candidates that, that we have. Yeah, my position to Trump is complex, you know, so I'm not going to, I don't think I want to respond to that, but I do want to kind of, Rearticulate what I was trying to say. I think a, a part of my point might have been missed about not being ready, because what I what my understanding is that uh, you know I was talking about having the right space, nurturing these right spaces for authenticity, and I think there is something to the to the scale of that space. I don't, I, I think that global objects, for example, I've already said this, they do animate an anxiety about the world. They, they escalate the, the meta crises. They make, they, they shut down discussion and they animate action because that's the narrative that they're telling. So when I'm talking about people aren't ready for um, nationalized healthcare, what I'm talking about is more the scope of the, of the, of the place that's having its economy around that nationalized healthcare. I'm looking for a localized governance and a localized uh, system that then supports itself with that financial economy. Does that make sense? I think the United yeah. States is just too large. So when I say it's not ready, yes, we need to nurture the conditions such that people want to buy into that system, which then trickles immediately back down to their direct society. This is, yeah, I think, the but, conditions yeah. that's going to breed a, a, a better buy-in. And not just a buy-in to begin with, but a, a, a continuing buy-in over the years, like sure, forever. Sure. Yeah. And 
and there's there's two answers to that one is that you know leftists are advocating for a lot of that localism right kind of mm -hmm. what's called like down ballot races right to get in these like like senators and congress people and and Ooh, he took off uh, his shirt this is good oh um, it's hot <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> um, um, you know city councilors and all these things and like a lot of them are you know speaking up more progressives are getting elected like aoc right is one of these types of sort of heroes or, or heroines um but the other thing is like like local communities don't have the same resources that a federal government has right so local communities can't just manifest the money to invest in these things and you know even if they do they're they're fraught with the same struggles that exist at the macro level right so there needs to be bottom up and top down organization around these things and the green new deal actually enables a lot of this bottom up entrepreneurial spirit and like community reform right because it's going to have different applications in different places right you're not going to put solar panels in you know like alaska you, you know you're going to put them in arizona like the you know mm -hmm. and 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 whatever um these sorts of things so so you know the local and the and the meso level of national mm -hmm. federal governments yeah, and, and, and the global word. the macro level mm -hmm. all have to mm -hmm. work together you know and so like i get i get worried when things are collapsed into a kind of chicken egg kind of paradox like oh we need to start at the individual and then scale up you mm -hmm. know or you know and li likewise if people are just yeah, talking i've heard about, you talk like that before you know yeah, yeah. i tend to sound like i'm only advocating mm -hmm. top-down solutions but that's not mm -hmm. that's not the case i'm advocating mm -hmm. for kind of the convergence of everything so Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, just the, the, the basic point is that, you know, local communities don't have equal resources or means, you know, there needs to be a kind of national yeah, discourse right. to, yeah, to yeah. kind of reset the EE, -E, kind of the, 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 the means and the, and the narrative, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and to start depolarizing and deescalating this extreme inequality situation that, that the world mm -hmm. has dug itself into, like the north-south mm -hmm. divide, mm -hmm left right divide rich poor divide you know my mission is simple is to clo close those gaps mm -hmm. yeah I get, yeah i mean well in a way yes i just i i, I we just disagree yeah. on if it's going to happen at the global scale or if it's going to happen at the local scale that that kind of division of, yeah. uh, or breaking down of these what i call these physiological epistemic identities that, that are that are the problem you know, it's interesting, earlier you talked about, I want to come back, I didn't get to address this, but it actually kind of has some relevance here. You were talking about X-Files being metamodern. The narrative that I always tell. It's very romantic. It's very romantic too. I could talk a lot about just that, okay. but, but okay. Go, ahead. go ahead. Let's see if we can tie that, all of that into what we were just talking about. Let's, let's see. It'd be quite a success if we can. But I always say, you know, if, if Star Trek is the modern, the, like the epitome of modern, of the modern um, ideal and the uh, modern virtue in science fiction, because it's out to make a conquest, it's out to conquer. You know, there's, you know, it, it couples this colonialism narrative. This was the modern project, imperialism, the way I see it. Then you have postmodernism. Well, let me it, just finish. Well, the, let me clarify because I'm, I'm a next generation fan, especially, but. It, <laughs> it, what uh -oh, it, I hit a what, nerve. <laughs> what it does, what it does, just to clarify, because I know what you're trying to yeah. say. What it does is it yeah. mirrors that kind of imperial, especially the kind of nautical aspect of it, era mm -hmm. of human history. But the Star Trek universe specifically is anti-colonial, right? Mm -hmm. It's more like United Nations in space, right? So I just wanted to like yeah, foreground yeah, okay. the tension. It's trying to match those aesthetics in order to actually be That's more fair. be more meta modern, especially in yeah, the next I generation. Guess. Next generation is all about peace and diplomacy. Mm. All yes. the other Star Trek shit is about war. So there's yeah. a there's a huge gap there, and you know the fans but, are. But, really but even that, uh, even that, you know, what is it called? The United Federation of Planets. I think even even though that may feel. Uh, if you're claiming that's meta modern, it still feels modern to me. I think that was the, sure, that's the ambition sure. of liberalism. Uh, ultimately, liberalism wants everyone to be, just get along, right? We're all we're all one. Yeah. So it feels very modern to me. Now, let me make my point about the the. the I would I would say, sorry, Picard is a meta modern <laughs> man in a modern universe. <laughs> Go ahead. Except for the uh, new Picard series. So if that is the narrative, 
of, of Star Trek and framing it as, as this modern uh, science fiction epitome of, then for me, X-Files must be the postmodern equivalent in science fiction because now if you look at these massive empires that we've built, that, you know, uh, coming out of the Cold War, now it we now we're struggling with that product that we created. You know, now we have all these conspiracy theories. What's the government yeah, covering up? Yeah, we yeah. went from from trying to build it now to suffering within it, right? So I don't know what the what the meta modern equivalent is, but this is the narrative I always tell. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I totally forgot why that was relevant. Now, sorry, I, <laughs> with all I, of our back and forth, I was going to make that relevant to the Bernie talk, but whatever. I, I, I think I can catch the catch the pass partially. Okay. Here. That's that. <clears throat> You're right. Most of the X Files is very postmodern, and and I could I could talk a lot about that, you know, because it's like you know the quest for truth, but he never quite he never never quite gets the truth, you know, mm-hmm. and and all that kind of stuff. However, when I say it's meta modern, it's these moments or the kind of the the the, the through line that makes it something more like it gets meta reflexive. Right. And so, so the mm-hmm. episode that I was referencing, which is from like, you know, the early seasons, it's mm-hmm. like very meta humor. There's it's, it's from one particular writer director on the series, right. Darren Morgan. And he writes mm-hmm. these like absurdist kind of like meta fictions and, and fans really pick up on that. So these are the moments that kind of peaks into meta modernism. And mm-hmm. then like they, there's also, an episode or two in the in the 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 reboot right the reboot which happened over the past few years kind of like season 10 and 11 mm-hmm. <clears throat> um so so it's both right it's postmodern and metamodern because the metamodern move is to like reframe the framing and the like the the absurdity of it and and to and to like double down on the romanticization right of kind of, mm-hmm. of storytelling of the characters is the characters are very very unique this is what i love mm-hmm. about the whole creation of the x-files universe right <laughs> it's like it's two like beautiful smart people man and a woman and they're partnered right they're partnered and they're juxtaposed juxtaposed mm-hmm. and it's a conscious choice it's a conscious choice by the writer <clears throat> to um to not sexualize their relationship right to keep them apart to keep this tension for the audience's Mm -hmm. sake and for the integrity of the characters to keep them apart and it's like it's so it's such a tease right it's like this 20 year 20 year tease (laughs) and so i think that's it's metamodern just in that it's not taking the easy way out it's not giving into the pressure Mm -hmm. it's it's beholding this quest for truth and for love above everything else right <clears throat> and it makes these characters kind of like superhuman in a sense um but they do eventually get together right they have like a strong pl- platonic platonic love and they eventually you know get get romantic but most of it's off screen right it just kind of you know it, it's hinted at and so okay. i dropped out of watching i guess at this point i'm, I'm not sure yeah yeah <laughs> So yeah, I just wanted to kind of cover cover some of that ground, you know, like uh, it's interesting too because, you know, Fox Mulder starts off as a as a like a forensics kind of in, like investigator in the FBI like tracking serial killers. But the but the paranormal stuff is always in the background, right? So it starts off as like a very serious conventional kind of like serialized uh FBI world right it's like very mm-hmm. very like mm-hmm. for all the kind of like cop action we see in movies like the 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 fbi world that they're creating is like pretty authentic pretty close mm-hmm. to truth and authenticity mm-hmm. you know and this is like just like like real people like doing mm-hmm. their jobs like i mean the fbi has a kind of pretty sordid history right it's pretty pretty racist and all these things but mm-hmm. but they you know, they kind of dignify the work because of course there is a lot of good people doing that kind of work, but then it takes the whole kind of paranormal turn, which is the whole, the whole kind of theme of the show. Um, So, you know, it's, it's one of the most popular TV series ever. So like, like that with like Star Trek and, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like, we can look at these things like from a, from a point of like deep critical appreciation, you know, and, 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 and extract 
value, a lot of value from them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from the exegesis. Yeah. You know, I, I know that Daniel uh, referenced, uh, Daniel Gertz referenced uh, The Fountain. Okay. Uh, as, as a very meta modern movie. And I actually didn't know what he meant by that. It just so happens it's yeah. one of my favorite movies. Cool. I don't know what he means. I don't know. Do you happen to know what that means? I don't, I, I, I don't remember him saying that or writing that. I mean, okay. I've, I've seen the film and, <clears throat> and, I, and I like it. It, mm-hmm. it's also it's also you know very surreal very mind-bending so mm-hmm. you know very artistic so you know take yeah. from it what you what you will i i couldn't say for sure what makes it meta modern okay. yeah okay i was just thinking of but, uh, some modern movies but I, i'm not sure <laughs> yeah i mean i like i like like i mean definitely meta humor you know whether it's kind of mainstream mm. like the movie tropic thunder comes to mind like mm. it's incredibly meta it's so so meta 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 um, mm-hmm. But then also, I can understand I, why you say that. Yeah. I love like Charlie Kaufman films, mm-hmm. like like um, like Being John Malkovich, or mm-hmm. like uh, Adaptation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, know, Adaptation because, was good. Because yeah, movies yeah. like that, like they they tick a lot of boxes. You know, they're yeah, really yeah. well written. They're very meta. <laughs> um, yeah, and then you know, just the you know sort of the conventional Dutch Dutch school analysis, you know, points to things like community. Like I, I love the show community. Mm, and, mm, um, well, that was good. We diffused know, it a bit there. I thought we, were getting a bit, yeah. thought we were getting a bit hot with it, with the Bernie <laughs> Sanders, the global local thing. So it was good. We diverted <laughs> yeah. that a bit. I don't know if I got my point across and why I even brought that up to be with. Yeah. But I think for, for the interaction between us, it was probably a bit healthy. Um, I don't know how much more we can go around that that local. I don't know if I have much more to add at this moment about that discussion about the local and the right. and, and the and the global. I think that we're both probably pretty committed to our stances, and I appreciate yeah. that you are you you play both. Whereas I admit I'm much more interested in animating the local. So yeah, and, and let me so. let me try to close out that particular point because there's yeah. so many. The world is so big, and there's so <clears> many <throat> locales that we don't know what's going on there, right? So think of like, like Compton, right? And like, like black sort of ghettos for lack of a better word, that mm-hmm. the, the CIA flooded them with crack, right? As a kind of like racial warfare, right? And this is something that like, we wouldn't even know about if it weren't for like heroic investigative journalism, right? So you know, history is full of these kind of conspiracies against people, against, mm-hmm. against locales, specific mm-hmm. locations, mm-hmm. right? And like, you know, like redlining and all that kind of stuff. And like, you know, uh, dis- voter disenfranchisement, like, so, you know, mm-hmm. you can be concerned with your local, with your location, but, you know, everyone's local is different. And yeah. like I said, I've been to India and South America and, you know, Hong Kong and Europe and like so at that point like what does the local mean like the local mm-hmm. is wherever you are and the local yeah, is where yeah. a lot of people kind of reside and situate themselves yeah. but, but that, that, yeah, everything that's not is for me to decide it's up for them to is, decide the local yeah but they don't have the decision that's what I'm saying if you're going to advocate mm-hmm. for localism you have to advocate for like trans localism right which means you have to have some literacy and consciousness of globalization <laughs> And you have to mm-hmm. oppose certain globalization narratives and embrace other globalization narratives, right? Like we need to be really careful. And this is a whole other discussion, like how to distinguish like what mm-hmm. is good, what is good globalization, what is bad globalization for the mm-hmm. local, right? And think mm-hmm. of like think of like water extraction, right? Like Coke as a multinational global corporation goes into mm-hmm. countries, right? Poor countries and just steals their water, mm-hmm. right? And so like what power do locals have? Actually, the only power that they're left with is to kind of protest and, and sacrifice their lives. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's inescapable that if we're going to mm-hmm. talk about the local, we, we can't just be nativist and reductionist about it mm-hmm. and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, focus on my own, little, my own little bubble, my own little enclave here. And if I'm happy, well, everybody else must be happy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but with the expansion of globalization, right, like internet technology, and the and the flow of finance and goods it it uh the the interconnections between all of us is deepening right and and it's enabling this connection this cosmopolitanism right you're you're an american Mm -hmm. in denmark Mm -hmm. and you're talking to a guy in 
you know, but fuck nowhere, Canada, <laughs> <laughs> um, ab about these things, about locals, about the global. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that has come back to bit me, though. It's interesting you bring yeah. that up. And I have had to contend with that while I'm an American living in Denmark, mm -hmm. because I am for migration. So this interconnected mm -hmm. loca localization mm -hmm. that you've ta talking yeah. about, I am definitely for. Yeah. But, you know, I was I was quite mm -hmm. I, just to tell a bit of testimony here about where I'm coming from. You know, I, I think there's a lot of value in the story to try and sympathize with my why I've rationalized the way I have. You know, I was very happily giving lectures in, in modern philosophy here in Viola, Denmark. Honestly, I, I was quite happy. Of course, I had dreams for a bit of a career, you know, and mm -hmm. in, in, in lecturing and philosophizing. But, you know, Trump got elected. And this, of course, disrupted my world. I thought, whoa, I'm living in a different type of world now. Yeah. So I was really drawn out of the local. And this is, and I was, I was starting to write a book about, you know, this postmodern world. And then this is how I encountered metamodernism through I think the philosophy matters facebook page it's how i'm eventually talking to you now i was drawn out of the local by this disruption you know by by trump and i think that was really quite unfortunate in the long run i mean now we're all contending with it i think we need you know this is something we need to do but ideally i think you know this is what i'm trying to solve i'm trying to set a, a, a an environment where we we're, our, we're not alienated, you know, we, we know how to put our affectivity into motion. There's that more direct feedback loop. That's why I'm interested in, in locality. You know, I, I think this apathy uh, towards uh, kind of the, the public sphere, you know, and, and, and uh, politics in general is, is really deanimating democracy, which I think when I look around, it looks to me like democracy is really struggling and it's and despite that it's it's an ideal that i try and keep up because what i see is what's taking its place is this activism there's a lot of this uh i'm going to show my force i'm going to show how powerful this movement is by the sheer number of of people that and by the by the by by my disgust and by the the, the you know the tone of my voice and the anger well this is a bit of bullying this is it wouldn't be democracy i know that it's probably a, they're going to always have that in democracy but it feels way too heavily burdened on one side and this is where democracy is struggling so this is why i'm about bringing things back to locally animating that that d democratic ideal again animating the public side because i think with this shift of everything to the private sphere you know that the only thing people are left with is their activism you know that's the only way to get anything done yeah. well, it doesn't feel good I agree. And Go ahead. It, it comes back to the listening society, right? Which we both advocate for. And protests happen because people are not heard in the first place. That, right. That's so what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're both advocating for an ideal where there's like deliberation, you know, everybody can be yep. heard. Mm -hmm. Like it's a kind of, it's how we want democracy to work. But there's, there's a thing called the democratic deficit, right? It's just inherent. To democracy but then there's like the way neoliberalism has actually undercut the foundations of democracy like education and you know that <laughs> ability to have an income and pay bills you know like like it's disenfranchising people that's why these protests don't actually represent bullying i get how they can seem that way and they can sound like nails on a chalkboard if you don't want to hear it but to the mm -hmm. art of listening to it looking at the pictures looking at the graphic violence particularly of the of the cops against innocent protesters and you know of course all the incidents that led up to this like the like the death of george floyd the murder of george floyd like mm -hmm. we we have to we have to stare into that abyss and we but have you know, to Brent, i have, only, I have just one more one more thing not only yeah. we, not only do we have to listen it's really important to that people start to do something that I've been doing for many years because of my training. It's like, you act, if you want to understand social movements, you have to actually study social movements, mm -hmm. right? You, you have to study sociology and it's really fucking hard, right? So this mm -hmm. is why like people are very smart. You're very smart. Lots of other people are very smart, but they, but they filter their impressions through particular life experience or expertise without getting the kind of academic framing or even just the, the, the proper framing through the protesters themselves, right? You have, mm -hmm. to, you have to consume the memes. You have to look at the, look at the, the signs that people mm -hmm. are holding up. 
and mm -hmm. let it affect you. Let it penetrate mm -hmm. your heart. Because these are not <laughs> these are not just people bullying. The protesters who are bullying are these are these idiots saying like I want I want a haircut or whatever. Like they're actually they're protesting the lockdown just because they want to exercise some some very personalized notion of of freedom, that's libertarian freedom that they've become addicted to. But that's not that's not real freedom. That's not freedom for other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to. I, I did get a bit reactive there for a second as you were talking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, you know, I just want to say, you know, I, I, I will stand my ground on the fact that this is, it, it feels like, uh, you know, power moves and it feels like bullying. Um, but I think that, you know, of course there's, I'm almost hesitant to bring up the point I was so re reacting to earlier, but I'll just go ahead and say it with a more calm resolute feeling now um you know i have people uh, i have friends who you know their daughters you know are, are posting uh on their facebook pages these are kids i i you know i knew i knew them when they were like four years old and growing up and now that they're in their teens they're posting things like you know white men are disgusting white men are the mm -hmm. problem sure, and i just sure. look at i just look at this uh, spillover you know, and, and you know, I, I hate this is why I was almost hesitant to bring it up because it's not directly related. And of course, I can separate them. But I just think that this activity of, of uh, fighting force with force is not what feels right to me. Yeah. Can you understand? Yeah, totally. Because I mean, I've encountered this a lot. And, you know, I'll, yeah. do, my, I'll do my best at, at, a, at a seductive rebuttal because I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to argue with what you're feeling, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, like I want to. Yeah, yeah, I want to invite you to my perspective on it, because I have friends like this. I have male friends too who get kind of offended by the kind of overzealous condemnation of white mm -hmm. people, of white men, mm -hmm. right? But like, yeah. so there's, there's a couple things I can say, right? Look, I'm a white man, <laughs> right? So if 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 I'm seeing that stuff too, or even maybe if I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. There's a reason I'm not personally offended, right? Mm -hmm. And you, I know you're a good guy, so you should recognize that those things don't, don't apply to you, right? Mm -hmm. they, they are gross generalizations, but if, you know, good white men, especially if they become literate in the subject, should be able to kind of overcome the feelings and understand the perspective of that person, whether it's a black woman or a white man uh -huh. like me, right? And you can kind of sympathize. And so, so just to, to clarify this point, right? When people yeah. say, and I know this is hard for people to hear, but when people say yeah. white people, right? Uh -huh. when, when, when people say that, mm -hmm. it, it is an oversimplification, but in terms of like understanding systemic racism and the history of white supremacy, like, it's due, it, you're saying. It's an There's abs due cause for it. It's an abstraction. <clears throat> it's an abstraction that has some salience in the real world. Like it, it corresponds to some real things, right? So if mm -hmm. you were able to see it through, through this perspective, which is, mm -hmm. which is my view and like other people's view, like you could then be disgusted. Like, so there's a meme that pops into my head because it's recent, right? And you know, it, it's a specific instance of how systemic racism happens on the, on the macro scale. And there's a judge, there's a white, a white judge who I think, you know, had some kind of racist ties, right? But whether, whether that's the case or not is beside the point. So uh, let's say possibly it's true and he's an explicit racist, but is still, mm -hmm. a is still a judge, right? That happens. But let's also say another scenario where it's just implicit and he just has an implicit bias. And so the case is there's two people, a, a, a white guy and a black guy. They both commit the exact same crime on the books. It, get, it has the same kind of measure and punishment to fit the crime. But the, but the white guy got like whatever, like, 30 days community service, whatever, right? The black guy mm -hmm. gets like 20 years in prison, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not just a random anecdote. This is not an outlier phenomenon. This is the pattern. And also just studying whiteness studies, you know, and studying critical race theory and studying history, 
through these lenses and consuming black culture, consuming black comedy and black scholarship, black Marxism, you know, there's a major people don't get the, the, the difference that white nationalism is about like an ethno state and black nationalism is actually fighting for equality. Right. So mm. they sound the same, but they're not the same. So this is, you know, this is a metanoia that each person has to go through on their own, you know, and this is where I, I have no choice but to invest faith and, and confidence and, and try to give support to people's journey to do that. Right. And so, because I've been exposed to so much of the kind of sociology and history that I'm, I'm desensitized to it. So I have no, I personally have no problem when people say like, oh, white people suck or whatever, or like there's too many white men in, in the history books and in power, because these are abstractions that, um, that, that correspond to some very awkward realities, you know? Um, yeah. And I, it sounds I like a lot. I mean, I understand I was, your position. Yeah. I wasn't even looking at you, so I didn't yeah. see if how you were, how were you, you were Reacting responding to it physically, but I, yeah. I'm just kind of speaking kind of stream of consciousness. Yeah. Maybe it's okay. You weren't looking at me. I don't know. I have mixed <laughs> feelings. I, 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 I obviously know the narrative you're telling. This is the, the narrative you hear from, from that, that, yeah. that position. But it's, that it's incredibly view. complex. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think, think most it's fine. people don't know, they don't know it as well as they think they do. They've heard it, they've heard it a ton, but they don't know it yeah. as well as they think they do. And this mm -hmm. is why MLK, you know, like becomes co-opted by history, you know, like his mm -hmm. message gets lost. And yeah, you know, yeah people falsely equivocate Bernie Sanders who marched with MLK and Joe Biden who advocated for segregation, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if there's much I can say about it at this time. I, I, I do think that it feels wrong to push around this object, is all I'll say. Uh, it doesn't feel metamodern to me to want to really go beyond the discussion and have that ecstatic new, new identity uh, arise in the moment. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not a very well-developed retort. I get that. It's, it's more of a gut feeling, and I don't have good words for it, but... I hope you can at least respect that I feel that way. And, and, oh, for sure. and, and hopefully that you don't feel that you're above me either. Like, oh, Justin will, he'll eventually go through it. You know, he'll have this <laughs> revelation. I hope yeah. that, that would be, that would also be sad if that was the position you had. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be, I don't want to be patronizing. Yeah. Um, but, but like, there's one other way I want to try to frame it because all I can Wait, do are is. You try, are you trying to convince me? Well, all I can do is try to contextualize <laughs> kind of a way through for you because because you're admitting your own challenge and you're saying it, it it hangs largely on identity right and so here's here's the kicker yes um you know like like a black woman like in the context of society doesn't have as much agency over her identity and how she's seen in that society right so i'm i'm watching videos of like mm. like black people being harassed in parks and stuff like it's you know it's grotesque, obviously, but, but the, the double standard is like, you know, like then white people tend to identify with that. Right. And if what I'm saying is if, if you or white people generally want black people to get over their identity, right. To transcend it, then white people also mm -hmm. have to transcend their identity because all the IDW mm -hmm. kind of, hmm you know, criti criticism of identity politics, the truth is, yeah. and, I've, and I've seen it, it's a well-developed argument from Matt McManus, right? He calls it postmodern conservatism. The, yeah. the, 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 the right criticizes identity politics, like Ben Shapiro hates mm -hmm. it. Yes. However, what he's doing and what they're doing is identity politics. So the, mm -hmm. two, things, the two things are mirroring each other, right? Yeah, There's yeah, I get that, yeah. On both sides, and if we both, <clears throat> if we both want to transcend it, then you need to actually reset the foundations to be mm -hmm. equal with kind of truth and reconciliation, reparations, you know, all of this stuff. And it's not even going to affect me and you in a direct way. Mm -hmm. This is why for me, it's so easy to advocate for it. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah let's, 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 let's uh, atone for past mm -hmm. mistakes because like the way history is taught is, is mm -hmm. still really whitewashed in every country, right? Every country. Um, and so this is really important to kind of reset 
identities and narratives and you know provide that nurturing to bring it back to your idea of truth and nurturing to provide that mm -hmm. to actually allow people to flourish right yes. so yeah not to be kind of what's called class reductionist right but there's mm -hmm. there's, there's a common economic struggle across the left and right which mm -hmm. which should be able to unite us to mm -hmm. overcome some of some of this identity tension right but, yes. but we can't put the onus on people who are actually oppressed say black people we can't put the onus on them to pull up mm -hmm. their bootstraps and to to get over their identities and stop calling out white people when there is a kind of white structure right even if we like ignore the individuals the the, the bad apples of the cops right and mm -hmm. you know we, there is a structure there is a structure that is beyond mm -hmm. all of us individuals and so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's important but i'm for deconstructing that constr that, that mm -hmm. structure also you know mm -hmm. i'm for that definitely mm -hmm. right yeah so it's it's a difficult thing to do and it's uh you know it's 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 definitely a, a transpartisan issue but i feel like it's the mm -hmm. one that the left it's a it's, it's an issue that the left leads mm -hmm. and the yeah. left is opposed for it so for us to overcome any of this in a meta modern way there needs to mm. be a, a, a kind of you know new consensus around these things and you know um you know listening to yeah those, to those voices and then you know like i said earlier too with the 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 bestsellers a lot of anti-racist books are kind of climbing the charts and in, in the mm -hmm. top five right so you know people are trying people are trying mm. and, and i think it comes back to also pushing. to to that that feeling that i was talking about about you know the free will and the fact that i i struggle to even use that description to describe any any agency in my experience you know i'm not right i just gotcha. it's it's it, it's hard for me to even live in this world of power to and, you know to now take it really abstract you know i it is a bit, I, I hear the, what you're saying. We need to champion this, this power narrative in order to get to where we want to go into it's a meta modern, uh, meta modern society. I get that. But it, it is really almost impossible for me to buy into that power narrative. I, I, and you may say, well, you know, you, again, you can psychologically, you know, <laughs> psychologically or whatever all you want, but it just, uh, I, I can't embody that. And I would, I would rather go for some oh, establishing that 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 you know that those localized discussions that are that are very safe and nurtured and almost like a, a psychological setting itself. You know, here at Spinner Hall, where I where I um, lecture, one of the community developers here, she looked at me and she said, "Justin, maybe you should start like a men's group." And I looked at it, I was like, I would never want to do, I never imagined myself doing something like gendered like that. Right, but I, right, I kind right. of, after mm -hmm. some reflection, I actually, because when I do these lectures here, uh, it's a lot of women. It's more than 50% women. I, I think that's very interesting. Cool. Uh, but to the point, there, there was something right to what she was saying. Because I think she's someone who realizes that I like that very nuanced uh, discussion that that very you know I yeah of course the global narrative the, these reduced narratives they're there to empower people and rally people they don't they don't resonate with me because they they gloss over all that's interesting about life so but you know with this men's discussion group you know, I think she was trying to tap into that say hey maybe men in this you know I guess they used to be popular in Denmark I don't know she was trying to give me a bit of history but maybe you know opening up a, dis, a, a space for that type of discussion would be something that would be good for the community here and good for you and so forth. This is much more, this is where I draw my, my interest from. Because I, I hear your narrative and I, and I understand that world that you're living in. I'm just trying to paint this other type of world to live in, you know, and, and how it would feel to be in that world. So this is where I'm coming from. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I, I relate to, to your resistance to that men's work because I've never been attracted to that either mm -hmm. like like it, it like you say it's gendered and i want to do things that are yeah. that are beyond that mm. for everybody right at the, mm. at the human level um i guess there's something to be said for you know compartmentalizing for the sake of crystallizing some of these issues right mm -hmm. and also like you know you could be a men's group that like gets together and like 
does push-ups and drinks beer or whatever <laughs> like hyper masculine yeah, yeah, yeah. bullshit but you could also be like a men's group that gets together and reads feminism yeah but that's also going to fall into tropes and see i wouldn't like that either maybe, then, you maybe know? but like i don't know or uh, like, this no is, I'm, I'm agreeing with you like yeah. that would be bad in my opinion you know yeah i have a very inter interdisciplinary education mm -hmm. right like it's a, it's a mix of like philosophy economics history political science sociology but I have never taken a women's studies course and I've never taken a black studies course, but having taken courses in different things and also like critical courses that kind of, you know, contextualize the like, like postmodernism and the, the fem feminist and black traditions, right? I'm versed in them. Um, my point is like, I have mad respect for those fields because they're kind of like bottomless, right? And it's not a waste of time to get into it. Mm, it in mm. fact, it, pay, it pays dividends mm -hmm. to explore these narratives mm -hmm. that, that, are, that are largely alien to the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. the, the yeah, that sounds exciting. Even, even yeah. now I can feel myself kind of, yeah. Yeah, the historically One of the objects I love narratives like... of men and minorities. And then, and then this is at complete odds, complete odds with a Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson type character who wants to mm -hmm. close those departments. And I can guarantee you he's never taken a woman's studies class. He can't even name a, a, a female philosopher that he likes. So, you know, that's the, this is the, this is the backwards hyper-masculine bullshit that we need mm -hmm. to get away from. Mm -hmm. And we need to respect the, the, the depth of knowledge out there. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the, 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 what you get really got me inspired there on a positive note, I have to good, say. Good, good. <laughs> was, yeah. Because one of the objects that I really... Part, you know, part of this global narrative that doesn't resonate with me is I, I often like get, I get a cringy and uncomfortable that like, and also the liberal narrative that we finally, you know, reconciled everyone and everyone is this kind of domesticated, same yeah. liberal person. It scares on, on, on paper. It, it's scary. Yeah. It scares me because I really enjoy that. What I would call the exotic if we're talking about aesthetics here. You know, I like to talk about aesthetics, but I really like that feeling of encountering that exotic object, which is kind of what really piqued me when you were talking about these disciplines. Yeah, yeah. different ways of framing the world. So interesting, right? Yeah. Do so you know, of course Ed, there's value in that. Do you know Edward Said, Orientalism? Yeah, I know Said. Yeah. yeah, because that's like, you know, Orientalism is the kind of demystification of the fetishization of the Orient, mm -hmm. right? During and the Romantic so, period. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. We need to get over this through, yes. through that kind of knowledge. It's super emancipatory. Yeah, yeah, the Arabian Nights is one of my favorite fairy tales. Uh, you're talking about Said. I think he's written some something on the Arabian Night fairy tales, uh, and that for me is a, a great confrontation with with the exotic. Like, wow, this is a very different world to live in. Yeah. And of course, the ones I originally encountered were the heavily French influenced versions at first, and then there was the Richard Burton, which is scholars really uh, critique for being over overly grotesque and so forth. You know, a lot of Brit humoring of the British culture during that period in those books, but. Even that, each one of those translations, I, at least back translated back into English in the French case, I find different worlds opened up in each. I think they're all valuable, I have to say. I, mm -hmm. You know, we're not, we're not talking politics here. It's a little less critical. But, man, I just love that, that object of, of the exotic, I would call it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So are we about out of steam, Brent? <laughs> well, we're at, we're at two hours and 20 minutes. So yeah. it's, that's probably a good time to, to wrap it down. I think we've had- I think we're just doing it for ourselves. We're not doing it for the audience anymore. They probably <laughs> tuned out a while ago. <laughs> probably. We, we've had a, I think we've had a good constructive dialectic. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 what that's, what we, right. that's what we yeah. both wanted. Yeah. But what's good is like you say, two different sides coming together. And I, I appreciate that I can have this with you, so. So thanks for uh, being open to this idea. Yeah. And, you know, we can, we can all change and change is inevitable. And I don't think I'll ever migrate over to the far right. But, but, uh, <laughs> but there, there, are, there are stories, you know, look, the, the mainstream <laughs> narratives are dominated by people like Dave Rubin making dramatic, you know, moves from the left to the right. And if you look at these narratives closely, it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> You know, it's just embarrassing mm -hmm. that it's anti-intellectual and he's being like co-opted by money and he's also being pushed 
justify this, the sort of screeching criticism that you're talking about, right? Mm. So it's all connected. But mm. what I love hearing about story, stories, and I think, I think if I'm getting it right, I think it's cuck philosophy. I think, let's just say cuck philosophy. Uh, I, I, I'm not familiar. Okay. It, it's, it's a YouTube channel, right? And it's a okay. guy who was a kind of right-wing libertarian mm. and, you know, moved to Scandinavia, not unlike yourself, right? <laughs> so, you know, I can dig up this episode or you can, you can just look up <laughs> the channel, channel yourself. Okay. But his, the episode where he talks about his story is really interesting because he went mm -hmm. from being a far-right libertarian to someone mm -hmm. who became really just literate and compassionate about what actual kind of leftist politics and discourse is about. And so, mm. you know, people can move, people can change. Mm. And yeah, of course, yeah. I'm you not know, maybe, I wasn't maybe, meta maybe, modern yeah, back in the day. Yeah. Maybe hope is lost for Dave Rubin, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, are you suggesting that hope may not be lost for me? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said earlier, you know, you sounds like you are judging. Yeah. Uh -oh. You can, you can, you can stay where you are, you know, in terms of, in terms of like persuasion and, you know, disposition, you can be a conservative. Like, I think that's fine. I think, I'm, I myself move around like that, you know, like I actually have a quite conservative lifestyle now mm -hmm. and I admire conservatives like Edward Snowden, but on the issues that matter, like healthcare, you know, we, we can and we should converge. We should build consensus, we should agree and we should pass laws that make these things the new normal and irreversible. Mm -hmm. And then in that new metamodern context, you know, you'll have all sorts of people, uh, but a lot more listening, a lot more tolerance. Um, yeah, and you know, conflicts will be mediated by dialogue instead of mm. violence, mm. right? We share that picture. I can say. Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. There, <laughs> there are our, some, there are some violent people out there. You know. I think when and, we probably, if you were me, to you know, sit down and, and make a painting, <laughs> you know, paint your what do you, what do you, what are you doing with this politics? What are you doing mm -hmm. with this philosophy? Paint it on a picture. Our mm -hmm. pictures might look very similar. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, that 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 probably is true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's maybe end that there on a positive note. I knew we could do it. Sounds good.